can also help us to organize this. Um, I would like Hello, to. Hello, uh, sir. I would like to talk a little bit about uh, our. Hello. Yes, can hear you. Sir, thirty seconds to count down. Do you want to Facebook Live? Jago. Okay, ready, start. Okay, thank you very much, uh, everyone, all over the world, and uh, uh, who's joining here uh, from Bangladesh uh, and the uh, UK today. Uh, Planetary Health Network, uh, uh, we just want to tell you that we are working uh, since the beginning of the corona uh, uh, graphs, the whole world, and uh, our inspiration to bring all the educator through the whole world to help uh, the frontline young physician. And I'm really grateful for today's session on hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a, a quite common um, a malignancy in Bangladesh uh, for the liver, as you know that hepatitis is, is very common. And uh, we are very fortunate to have some great thought leader of uh, hepatology, uh, as well as uh, hepatocellular carcinoma um, here. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, uh, our director, Dr. Shakil Farid uh, from UK, uh, who's a, th a thoracic surgeon from uh, Oxford University is here, and he helped us to organize, uh, uh, to do this uh, program. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, Professor uh, 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 Shopnil, uh, my younger brother, Mamun al um uh, to get him here. Uh, I'm also very, very grateful to my younger brother, uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf Halash, uh, uh, Ashraf Malek, um, uh, will be the main speaker today. Uh, I'll uh, like to introduce uh, with uh, some great uh, speaker and the faculty today. But the first, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Joseph uh, Browdy. Dr. Joseph Browdy is the se section chief uh, and the interventional radiologist uh, from Lourdes Division of Virtual Health, New Jersey. Um, hello, Dr. Browdy. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? We're doing good, and we're really uh, grateful uh, that you join us today, and we'll hear from you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I'm very, uh, very honored. Um, I would say that uh, one of the icons of uh, Bangladesh, uh, you know, uh, Professor Muhammad Ali is here. Professor Muhammad Ali uh, is a pioneer of uh, hepatobiliary surgery in Bangladesh. Um, he was trained in Australia. Um, he worked with um, um, some great icon of hepatobiliary surgery, but he left Australia, come to Bangladesh to establish the department. I was talking to him, listening to him, his struggle to develop the department in Bangladesh, perform the first liver transplantation in Bangladesh successfully, uh, and how he did that. Um, and uh, I salute him to, to do that. I salute him to train a whole new generation of uh, <laughs> hepatobiliary transplant surgeon in Bangladesh, uh, and uh, I'm really grateful to him to join here today, uh, Professor Muhammad Ali. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Uh, I would also like to introduce uh, uh, one of uh, a very dynamic leader of uh, hepatology in Bangladesh, Professor Dr. Mamun al Matab. Dr. Mamun al Matab, uh, I also fondly know him as Shopnil. Uh, he's a chairman of Department of Hepatology of Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Medical University, chairman of uh, FSLD, uh, president of um, uh, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University Hepatology um, Group. Um, Shapil, thank you very much uh, to join us. I know you're doing a lot of work in Bangladesh and we'll hear from you. Uh, I'm also like to introduce uh, uh, another uh, young uh, physician, uh, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Hashim Rabbi. Um, uh, he is uh, 
known to me, close to me uh, from various perspectives, a, a bright, brilliant uh, surgeon in Bangladesh. Hashim, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, uh, and then I would like to introduce uh, my very close friend. We grew up together in Bangladesh, uh, uh, associate professor and the head of the Department of uh, Radiotherapy, Chittagong Medical College, my alma mater, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Dr. Sajjad Muhammad Yusuf. Thank you, Sajjad, for joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sajjad. And then uh, one of my younger brother, you can say, we, uh, I see him grow up in Chittagong Medical College, uh, Dr. Muhammad Saifuddin. Dr. Muhammad Saifuddin is the associate professor, Department of Hepatobiliary and Liver Transplant Surgery in Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman uh, Medical University. Thank you, Saif, for joining us. Um, and I would like to thank, obviously, um, uh, Shakil for it um, uh, to, jo to join us. Um, uh, and uh, we have uh, our um, uh, PHA uh, from the PHA site. Uh, Mahbub is always helping her here, and he's here today. Mahbub Alam, thanks, Mahbub. Uh, I also want to acknowledge here that uh, one of our mentor, uh, Professor Mosin Choudhury, uh, Muhammad Mosin Choudhury from Chittagong, he joined us. I'm, it's so nice to see him. Uh, we, we, he, he taught us medicine. He always gave us good, uh, good advices. Um, always used to tell me, Atik, uh, don't do too much politics. Don't do too much cultural programs. Focus on medicine. And uh, thank you. Uh, uh, it's so nice to see him uh, after a long time. Uh, so I would not uh, wait. Um, I would like to, uh, I'll introduce uh, some other faculties at his goals, but uh, would like to start it. This is Facebook Live and uh, people are watching from all over. I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Ashraf Malik. Uh, Dr. Ashraf Malik is um, a, a Associate Medical Director of Transplant Hepatologist. Um, and he is our uh, one of the important faculty uh, when it comes to hepatology for planetary health academia. Uh, he is um, uh, from Virtua Center of Liver Disease and Transplantation, New Jersey, very much involved with liver transplant team there. Uh, and he successfully done a few of our very important session with PHA. Planetary Health Academia is basically is a, a non-profit uh, philanthropic organization from all the physicians who are Bangladeshi origins, who are working all over the world and who are contributing uh, uh, to, uh, to, to share their experience with the young physicians uh, in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, I would not uh, pass much time to, I welcome Dr. Ashraf Malik uh, for his presentation on hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. Thank you, Atik Bhai. Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, good morning uh, to everybody uh, in USA and UK. Good evening to all the uh, speaker, the panelists, and uh, all the audiences who are in uh, Bangladesh. So, uh, I'll just start my, start my uh, uh, a slide, let's see if we can share it. Uh, it says host disabled uh, participant screen sharing. Shabri, you should be able to um, do it now. Okay. Thank you. So, um, as we all know, uh, there has been uh, revolutionary changes in overall oncology field in the last uh, couple of decades, especially uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, and there has been a lot of advances in uh, evolution of management. So, uh, I was talking to uh, Atik Bai uh, about, um, uh, so we can make the uh, two session, the first session, um, uh, I will talk about uh, overview of diagnosis and management and the second, uh, the first session, first part will be overview of management and diagnosis. And the second part, uh, my very good friend, uh, Joe Brody, who is a section chief uh, uh, of interventional radiology at uh, Lord's Division of Varsha Health. Uh, Joe and I, uh, we've been working together for a long time uh, and uh, I know him personally, a great person an exceptional uh, physician and interventional radiologist, and he has done a lot of uh, work in uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, especially he has interest 
in uh, Y90, which uh, he'll be talking about today. So uh, the second part of our uh, discussion uh, would be uh, would be local regional treatment by Joe. So without uh, further delay, I'll start my talk, but uh, I'd like to uh, extend my uh, uh, thanks and gratitude to uh, Planetary uh, Health Academia. It's a great platform and uh, I'm uh, honored to be part of the uh, uh, platform. Uh, I'd like to thank Atik Bhai, Tasveer Bhai, Shakil, and everybody who's involved in uh, Planetary Health Academia. So I'll start with the case. Um, uh, I just uh, brought a case uh, with uh, a Bangladeshi-born uh, a gentleman who was referred for evaluation of focal liver mass, which was detected on recent ultrasound. His hepatitis B was diagnosed many years ago when he had a jaundice, had a liver biopsy when he was seen by a physician. I was done about a year ago. No history of uh, treatment for hepatitis B. He had a past history of appendectomy, former smoker, no history of alcohol or illicit drug use. There is no family history of liver disease or liver cancer. On physical exam, he is a well nourished male, uh, BMR 24, uh, otherwise normal vitals, uh, no sign of uh, or stigma of chronic liver disease, such as ascites, asterixis, cyanosis, no spider or pulmonary erythema. See if I get all right. On the laboratory test, uh, he does a mild elevation of ALT, low normal albumin, normal platelets, normal AFP, as we can see, surface antigen positive, negative delta antigen antibody. Liver biopsy that was done about a year ago showed mild portal and lobular inflammation uh, with the activity of uh, grade two out of four. He does have stage two to three fibrosis, which is early breeding. Ultrasound that was done, which showed liver is normal in size, increased acrogenicity, suggesting fatty infiltration. There is a 3.2 centimeter hypochaic mass in the left hepatic lobe. No uh, intra or extra hepatic ductal dilatation, patent portal, and uh, hepatic uh, vascular system. Triple subsequently, patient underwent triple phase CT abdomen, uh, which demonstrates smooth control liver. There is three centimeter mass against segment three, which demonstrated arterial phase enhancement and washout on the delayed phase, uh, hepatic artery, portal venous system, and hepatic veins are patent, no ascites, normal size spleen, and no uh, biliary pathology. So what is the appropriate next step? Uh, biopsy of the liver mass, chemoembolization, radioembolization, surgical resection, microablation, or radiofrequency ablation. Liver transplantation, cyber knife, systemic or uh, chemotherapy or immunotherapy. I will return to this question later at my talk, uh, and and we will discuss what we in USA uh, our first um, management option would be, and then I'd like to hear from the other speakers, panelists, and uh, uh, what would be done for this patient if the patient is in uh, in in Bangladesh. We all know ACC, uh, it's, uh, the incidence is rising. It's, it's still the fifth leading cause of cancer worldwide, third most common cause of cancer-related death. Cirrhosis is the most important risk factor. Over 80% patient with hepatocellular carcinoma, they have underlying cirrhosis. Screening, screening, screening it is very cost-effective. And I'll show you some data about surveillance and how it can affect uh, the treatment outcome, how it can affect the survival. It does improve survival. We know annual incidence is about two to 4% um, uh, for HCC. It can vary depending on the other factors, the age of the patient, whether there is any other cofactor like smoking, HIV, or uh, hepatitis B, presence of hepatitis B. There is a study done a long time ago, um, uh, probably right now it would be unethical to do this kind of study, but it was done in the 80s. Uh, a group of patients which were followed over time to see if um, how long it takes uh, for a tumor to grow or, inter or you know, how long it takes for a tumor to increase in size by more than 50%, so which is a doubling time. So it was seen that on the study, um, the average or median uh, doubling time of HCC is about 117 days, which is about uh, close to three months. For HCC, survival depends on four major factors, staging of the tumor, uh, degree of liver function, 
uh, patients' uh, performance status or called ECOG score and cancer-related symptoms. This is where the hepatocellular carcinoma differs from all other cancer because uh, when we decide or determine about management, the prognosis, not only the cancer uh, matters itself, but also the degree of liver function or severity of the liver disease uh, also comes into play. So, uh, and that can influence the treatment uh, guideline that can influence the uh, prognosis, which uh, we'll be discussing later. We all know who should be screened for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, cirrhosis, any patient with cirrhosis, either hepatitis C, hepatitis B, alcohol related cirrhosis, or NASH cirrhosis, or any other cirrhosis for, uh, should be screened for HCC. Uh, exception is hepatitis B. Uh, one of the important reasons for that is hepatitis B is a oncogenic virus or carcinogenic virus. Um, so uh, patients with hepatitis B, even without cirrhosis, with certain risk factor, should be screened for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, especially if it's Asian male, uh, more than 40 or female, more than 50 years old, family history of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, patient uh, born in uh, Africa or uh, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, if they're still very young, 20, more than 20 years old, should be screened for that. Patient with a uh, high HPV DNA level uh, suggesting ongoing inflammation. Uh, this was uh, a seminal paper published a uh, long time ago in Hong Kong showing different level of hepatitis B DNA level carries different risk of HCC. So higher the DNA level is, the higher is the risk of HCC. So any patient with... Uh, high HPV DNA and, and markers of ongoing inflammation should be screened for HCC as well. American Association for the Study of Liver Disease uh, guidelines recommend ultrasound and AFP every six months. Um, you know, it, it is ultrasound, it is cost effective. Uh, there has been a lot of paper about should, whether we should incorporate uh, a CT or MRI uh, but, you know, there's a risk of radiation exposure and, you know, higher cost with MRI and all that. So uh, since ultrasound it, it would be able to detect uh, some lesions and we can follow them or get a follow-up study. So it is felt that ultrasound is still cost effective for screening for HCC. AFP is something we, we all know that it is, uh, this has come from the York sac when uh, during our neonatal period or, or in the in utero and then after birth, it uh, returns to the undetected level. AFP call uh, can also be increased in uh, other situations such as um, if there's inflammation going on, uh, so patients may have elevated ASDLT, uh, any necroinflammation can cause elevated AL, A, alpha beta protein. If there's a active regeneration, also can cause AFP elevation as well. But the most common reason for AFP elevation in patients with liver disease is, is uh, we need to exclude hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, this is, AFP it can be normal in certain, uh, uh, a lot of the patient with hepatocellular carcinoma, about 80% patient may have normal AFP. Uh, these are non-circuitory uh, uh, tumor. Uh, um, so about only about 20 to 30% uh, HCC will have elevated AFP. There are other biomarkers, uh, PIFCA2 or called DCP, not uh, routinely used, but can be helpful if there is uh, still uh, a diagnosis uncertain or there's still high suspicion. Uh, this is an abnormal prothrombin protein generated by malignant uh, hepatic cells. Uh, it, you know, it can be useful in confirming the diagnosis. Uh, there are some early papers suggesting that high PIFCA2 level uh, can be associated with uh, portal vein invasion of tumor, which I mean, if there is a uh, thrombus in the portal vein and we're not 100% uh, certain, and uh, that can be useful uh, to distinguish between uh, tumor thrombus and, and bland thrombus. AFP L3 is an isoform of AFP. Uh, it's more specific for malignant cells or hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, it does have some utility in uh, confirming uh, diagnosis. Um, uh, it, uh, so it can, uh, patients who have elevated AFP of more than 20, and um, uh, in there's a lesion seen in the liver, and uh, we're not 100% certain this is something can be helpful. This is a study uh, looking at sensitivity and specificity of AFP and DCP. As you can see, um, AFP uh, 
uh, the overall the each uh, biomarker has uh, somewhat low sensitivity. Uh, if you see on the left um, side on the sensitivity, I uh, put it in the red uh, block, uh, somewhere between uh, 42 to uh, 59, 74 uh, percent. If you combine AFP and uh, DCP or PIFCA2, the sensitivity increased to 86 percent. So that means the false negative rate would be very low. So it's a good, very good screening tool if it's combined together along with the imaging study. Um, we all know that AFP alone or uh, along with the DCP should not be used as a screening tool. Patient uh, should undergo ultrasound uh, along with the AFP. So there are some uh, data I would like to share uh, how surveillance uh, can affect uh, patient's treatment and uh, survival. So this is a paper published in China, uh, patient with hepatitis B, uh, which were followed. Uh, this is a randomized controlled trial. Uh, there are about 18,000 patients were randomized to a screening group and control group. As you can see, about not more than 9,000 patients in both groups. Uh, there are 86 patients which are diagnosed with HCC in the screening group versus 80, 67 patients. 60% uh, of stage one cancer was diagnosed in the screening group versus no patient in the control group. And uh, the mortality, there's significant mortality benefit, as you can see in the bottom, 83% uh, in the screening group and 131. So there is more than 30% survival benefit if the patients are screened. Unlike hepatitis B, there is uh, no randomized control trial in cirrhosis uh, due to hepatitis C or any other reason, uh, but there is a meta-analysis done, uh, about 15,000 patients, which showed the screening does improve early, uh, early detection about, uh, if you look at the graph on the right side, two times more likely uh, able to detect early uh, diagnosis of uh, HCC. Uh, also, those patients can be offered a curative treatment uh, with an odds ratio of 2.24. Some of the studies, the same paper, uh, analyzed survival benefit uh, with the screening. Uh, if you look at the table in the uh, uh, middle column, uh, median survival, there's significant difference in all studies. Uh, uh, the the LSERAC study shows 298 days versus 130 days. Uh, Tong, Ong, Tanaka, and Trivasani studies, uh, all the studies shows uh, statistically significant difference in survival, uh, you know, screening group uh, in comparison to the control group. So a little bit about uh, physiology will kind of refresh our memory. Um, uh, we all know the liver is the unique organ has dual blood supply. And uh, since uh, liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma uh, primarily fed by hepatic artery and because of the dual blood supply, because of this unique nature, uh, 80 to 90% of the time, we are able to diagnose hepatocellular carcinoma without a biopsy. So this is unlike all other type of cancer where you need a tissue diagnosis. In hepatocellular carcinoma, we don't need a tissue diagnosis about 80%, 80 to 90% of the time. So, so what happens is uh, in normal or cirrhotic liver, you have two third of your portal flow. As patients begin to develop uh, dysplastic nodule or early HCC, the portal flow starts to decline. And then the nodules or uh, early HCC uh, uh, start to get uh, blood flow more from the hepatic artery. When there's established HCC, there is no to minimal portal flow. And how we can imply this on the imaging, I'll show you here and maybe Joe uh, may be able to, uh, uh, since he's a radiologist, able to more uh, give you further uh, insight about this. So the arterial phase, as you can see here, uh, there is a uh, enhancing lesions, uh, probably somewhere uh, in it, around segment eight or so. Um, and uh, because during the arterial phase, uh, the uh, the tumor is uh, getting all the uh, supply, uh, more supply of the arterial blood flow and uh, become bright. And the delayed or portal phase, since there is no portal uh, circulation to the tumor, it becomes dark. So it's darker than the rest of the liver parenchyma. And because of the unique nature, uh, we don't need to get a biopsy on uh, patients who have these uh, imaging characteristics. So what we do, if we find a lesion, patient uh, is uh, screened and found to have a lesion that is less than one centimeter on imaging or ultrasound, 
because we know the doubling time is about three months, so we can repeat the imaging in three months. So we're still we uh, can test the boat. Uh, you know, uh, if it's three months, so if it's still stable, uh, keep doing every three months up to eighteen to twenty-four months, and then uh, if it still remains stable, then we can return to a standard surveillance, which would be every six months. If it does enlarge, then I'll go to the next slide and how we approach uh, once it reaches more than one centimeter. So if it's more than one centimeter on ultrasound, we should do a dynamic imaging or we call it cross-sectional imaging. Either we can do MRI with contrast or we can do triple phase or triphasic CT. Uh, regular contrast CT would not be helpful if there is no portal phase, as we uh, discussed that uh, portal phase is needed uh, to diagnose uh, HCC based on uh, really graphically. So once uh, there's typical vascular pattern on dynamic, any of this dynamic imaging, we have our diagnosis. Uh, if there is a typical vascular pattern, meaning if there is no hyper enhancement or no washout or anything like that, then uh, or there's a high AFP, uh, patient should uh, get a second or other imaging modality. So if the patient had MRI done, should get a triple phase CT and vice versa. Uh, if the second modality is, uh, shows the typical vascular pattern, then we have our diagnosis. If it's still uh, a typical pattern, then patients should undergo biopsy of the mass. If the biopsy is non-diagnostic uh, and you know there is still suspicion, uh, repeat biopsy can be done or imaging uh, repeat imaging can be done in three months uh, depending on uh, what the suspicion is and depending on the patient preferences so but these lesions need to be followed one way or the other there are different staging system um, uh, for HCC, there's the UNOS. Uh, this is uh, applicable to uh, USA uh, patients who do undergo liver transplant for hepatocellular carcinoma. And there's a BCLC. This is most widely used. Uh, we use it in USA and other European countries. Uh, the benefit of BCLC is it is uh, in this staging system, everything is incorporated, uh, which will determine uh, the prognosis, uh, the type of treatment patients should receive depending on the staging, as well as, um, uh, um, you know, the liver function test also incorporated in the, into that. TNM system is the, uh, the standard uh, system for all other type of cancer. Uh, it's not widely used. CLIP is mostly used in Italy. Uh, again, uh, CTP scores in there, tumor morphology, AFP, more than 400, less than 400, and for wind thrombosis. For each um, uh, parameter, uh, there is a point given, and based on the points, uh, the staging is, is um, uh, uh, given for the patient. Okuda uh, system uh, uses tumor size, albumin, bilirubin, and cytis, uh, but it's not being widely used in, uh, in USA. So BCLC classification, which is called Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer Classification. Um, so there is a very early stage, um, which is single tumor less than two centimeter. Uh, most patient has preserved liver function. They are usually sharp PA and good uh, functional status. Early stage is between two to five, one single tumor or three or less than three tumor and each tumor has to be less than three centimeter in size. And this kind of patient also have uh, uh, somewhat preserved liver function and good uh, functional status. Intermediate stage is anything beyond early stage, uh, but no evidence of uh, vascular invasion uh, or any extra hepatic spread. Uh, that's intermediate stage. Advanced stage, when the intermediate stage uh, progresses further and have either a macrovascular invasion or extra hepatic spread, um, most patients will be either uh, child a, PUA or early B, um, and their median survival is about six months. Uh, when the patients develop child PUC and they have a poor performance status, as a, the three or four, um, this is uh, defined as a terminal stage with median survival is only three to four months, as uh, these patients uh, may not be a candidate for any, any type of treatment. ECOG score, you only know or all know that about the ECOG is a stern uh, cooperative oncology um, group. Um, it's been widely used in cancer oncology field. Uh, fully active stage zero, uh, one is uh, minor symptom can do only light activity. Uh, this is important because 
If this is incorporated into the staging system and uh, this will also uh, um, it will be utilized to determine whether or not what type of treatment patients should receive with you know risk of uh, complication because uh, based on their ECOG score and all that. So this is a UNO staging. Uh, this is uh, stage two is the BCLC stage B uh, single lesions. These are the patients are eligible for liver transplant um, uh, for stage two. For stage uh, three and four are the uh, other stages uh, that correspond with the BCLC. A uh, little bit busy slide. I'll uh, try to make it simple. So sorry for all these small words, but. Um, if you look at the diagram on the left side, uh, say stage liver function, uh, performance status, and tumor burden. Again, a very early stage is less than two centimeter uh, preserved liver function and good functional status. These patients uh, um, considered a, uh, a patients who can benefit from curative treatment option, which is uh, either resection or ablation. Uh, no resection, depending on their uh, whether there's any contraindication for the um, uh, based on whether or not they have cirrhosis with portal hypertension or if there's any medical contraindication. Otherwise, a uh, patient uh, should go undergo ablation with a good survival. Early stage A, uh, if you have a single uh, nodules uh, between two to five, and again, uh, the first option in USA would be this patient should undergo liver transplant. Uh, if they are not a transplant candidate, uh, then resection, again, um, you know, make sure there's no contraindication or they can uh, also receive ablation treatment. Um, um, now patients um, uh, who have more than uh, one tumor, but uh, less than three and less than, uh, all less than three centimeter in size, and again, transplant or ablation could be options. Now, although this is a BCLC management, uh, there has been, um, uh, you know, uh, we kind of, in our center, uh, we do combine treatment uh, with the ablation and uh, chemomobilization. And Joe, uh, probably will be able to show us some data on that. Um, uh, that combining ablation and chemomobilization uh, does improve survival and much higher efficacy. Uh, it has a synergistic effect. So, uh, if the patients, uh, even though they are transplant candidate, they still receive ablation treatment and embolization treatment. Intermediate stage are the best candidate for transarterial therapy uh, because these are larger tumors. Uh, ablation uh, may not work very well with these large tumors. Uh, so either they'll receive chemo or Y90. Advanced stage uh, are the patients who have uh, macrovascular invasion or extrahepatic spread. Uh, although systemic chemotherapy uh, is considered to be the first line treatment for this patient, there is some uh, recent data um, suggesting that uh, combining this with Y90 does improve uh, uh, efficacy and patient survival. Uh, Terminal stage, unfortunately, has a poor prognosis uh, uh, and not a candidate for any type of uh, um, resection or any uh, local regional or, or chemotherapy treatment. Just a kind of a couple of minutes on a span on liver transplant. Uh, it's the best treatment for early stage, um, excellent five-year survival, uh, much, much lower tumor recurrence rate than the other modality. It's only about 8 to 11%. Uh, although initial uh, transplant on HCC was dismal after adopting by uh, uh, a Milan criteria, which is uh, called stage uh, B criteria based on BCLC, which is single tumor, two to five, and three uh, tumor or less, each less than three centimeters size, uh, patient has an excellent survival. And uh, so far, this is a standard of care in patient uh, with cirrhosis and early stage HCC. All patients do receive local regional therapy, either ablation or uh, chemomobilization prior to transplant so that there is no viable tumor on the explant, which uh, can be determinant factor for recurrence. Resection uh, is only 5% in USA, probably more in Eastern region because uh, there are a lot more hepatitis B without cirrhosis, so they can be a resection candidate. Uh, again, portal pressure is the key. All patients, if they are resection candidate with cirrhosis, should undergo portal pressure measurement. Uh, if there is evidence of clinical portal hypertension, meaning that if the portal pressure is more than 10 millimeter mercury and there is high bilirubin, uh, they should not undergo resection because of the um, 
uh, higher mortality. And I'll show you some data on that. Uh, patients who have a uh, liver cancer on the left lobe do better than the right lobe because uh, risk of decomposition is higher. Recurrence uh, can be two types. True recurrence, um, usually recurrence occurs within two years. This is likely due to microsatellite uh, size of the tumor. If it's a bigger the size, uh, the more the chance of microsatellite. Or if there's a microvascular invasion that can be seen on the uh, biopsy or if the patient has uh, poor tumor biology. De novo recurrence is a um, new development of cancer usually occurs after two years and it happens in 30 to 40% of the time. Overall recurrence rate in uh, hepatic resection is about 40 to 50% at three years. This is a um, survival um, uh, depending on the bilirubin and portal hypertension. On the top red, you see the normal bilirubin and no portal hypertension. Uh, they have a five year survival is about 75%. Um, and with you know any of these, abnormal criteria, uh, the survival goes down. Local regional therapy uh, could be uh, uh, ablation and transarterial. And of course, transarterial, Joe will uh, discuss more detail about that. Ablation could be thermal or chemical. Uh, just to kind of spend a, a couple of minutes, uh, this uh, type of treatment and resection will be discussed much in detail about the actual procedure complication. We will have another session in the future. So hopefully there'll be much, much more detailed discussion about the ablation and, and uh, resection. But just uh, I want to spend uh, uh, two minutes on this. Uh, microablation uses high energy electromagnetic energy uh, that causes coagulation necrosis. It has uh, several advantages. It causes more uh, intertumoral temperature in a shorter time. So you have a more ablation, uh, more uh, profound ablation and wider ablation area, less heat sink effect. Uh, it works best if the tumor size is between two to three centimeter. Um, you know, it can be the efficacy rate ranges from 90 to 100% uh, if the tumor size is between two to three centimeter. Uh, unfortunately, the recurrence rate is still high, 50% at three years. Radio frequency ablation uses radio frequency generated heat causing tumor destruction, uh, almost similar survival and recurrence rate. The adverse event is also low in both cases, maybe a little bit more in microablation because of the wider uh, ablation area causing uh, more non-tumoral uh, tissue death. Uh, so there might be a less risk of hepatic decompensation. Chemical ablation, uh, ethanol usually less than uh, two centimeter tumor. If it's more than two centimeter, uh, it doesn't work very well because of the intratumoral septa. This is a um, retrospective uh, retrospective database study um, in, in Japan, about close to 13,000 patients, uh, less than three tumors, less than three centimeters in size. Uh, the differences in survival, um, surgical resection, RFA, and uh, ethanol, as you can see, um, more or less similar with the surgical resection, RFA, 85% and 81%. Fiber survival is slightly different, but not um, uh, between the surgical resection and RFA. If you look at the graph in the bottom right, uh, this is a recurrence rate um, for the, 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 the most bottom one is a solid bold green. It's a 43% three-year recurrence, that surgical resection. Uh, the solid line uh, just above it is about 57%, that's uh, RFA, and the dotted line is 64%, that's ethanol. Um, this one, I just put the slide in because I would like to hear something uh, from uh, Dr. Sajad. So we don't do a whole lot of uh, stereotactic body radiation. Uh, part of the reason could be because of risk of uh, decompensation. Most of our patients are cirrhotic and uh, there's a risk of radiation in this lung uh, liver disease, um, either classic or non-classic. So, and most patient has other comorbidities. So most patients we do receive, uh, usually, uh, you know, I have several patients who did receive uh, are the ones who are not accounted for TACE or Y90 or any other type of treatment. So that would be the option given to the patient. Usually the tumor size is five to seven centimeter uh, maximum uh, number is less than 1.3. Uh, the tumor should be away from the bowel because there is a uh, intestinal complication such as a gastric or duodenal ulcer perforation. Local control rate is 75 to 100 uh, percent. Uh, not a great two-year survival is at about 50 to 69 percent. Systemic chemotherapy, just to give you the names, and again, we'll have a future uh, session about the 
detail about oncology uh, in the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, there are three first, first line uh, FDA approved treatments, sorafeny, which has been there for a long, long time, since 2007. And then we have new one is lenvatinib. These are both uh, multi-kinase or tyrosin kinase inhibitor. Uh, Tizolizumab and bebasizumab, these are both uh, immunotherapy um, uh, now being approved for first line. And they have other second line immunotherapy. So we come to our uh, initial uh, case. Uh, since the patient is 55, no uh, comorbidities, uh, no evidence of cirrhosis, three centimeter tumor in the left hepatic lobe, the location is great. So uh, we would do a surgical resection on this patient um, uh, for the patient we discussed in the beginning. In summary, HCC surveillance is critical and can lead to early detection, uh, potential for curative treatment and improved survival. Uh, biennial imaging, preferably ultrasound with AFP should be done all patients with a high risk for HCC, uh, cirrhotic and AFP with male of more than 40, female more than 50, and or family history, etc. Surgical resection and thermal ablation, uh, such as microwave or RFA, offer sim similar survival in selected patients. Microablation and radiofrequency ablation has almost similar survival and recurrence rate. With that, I'll end my presentation and uh, I will uh, give the um, hand over to uh, Joe uh, to talk about TASE and uh, Y90, and then we can uh, have a uh, further speaker and then uh, question and answer session. Joe, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, one moment. Yeah, let me just pull up my slides here. Okay. Joe, I've done a lot of uh, our, our uh, he's our prime guy for all the uh, local regional therapy, the taste and Y90. So he has a tons of tons of experience in that. So. Yeah, sure. If you uh, can uh, uh, stop your sharing, then he can also do his sharing as well. Oh, okay, okay, got you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. I just have a few slides. It's going to be pretty brief, but I've got. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to do this here. Do you have a share screen? It's called. Yeah, I'm having trouble getting it put up here though. Hold on a second. <laughs> Joe, what device are you on? I'm on a I'm on a uh, MacBook right now. Okay, so it should be. Uh, yeah. So you can see the share option, can't you? Yeah. Hold on, hold on one. Yeah. Okay, just give me one moment, hold on. Um, I just had a, um, let me stop video sharing for a second. Would mute yourself, actually, you muted. What are you trying to do?
So whilst we're waiting, um, Atik Bhai, I can see uh, Professor Anisir Rahman sir has joined as well. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, as Professor you know, he's a very Anisir senior Rahman gastroenterologist is, uh, in the country. Yes. Yeah. Anisir, um, always sir. come and join us and encourage us in all the program. Uh, can I see Pro Professor um, Anisir Rahman sir? Uh, you always come here and uh, join us and encourage uh, the young physicians to join uh, in this program. Do you want to do the question and answer session while uh, Joe is trying to get his presentation up? I think, right? Sure. Um, or, uh, or before the question and answer, maybe we can um, we can just uh, uh, is a uh, Professor Mamun Al Mata busy on the line? Uh, Shapnil. I am here. Um, Maybe we can um, we can hear from him about the uh, perspective of hepatocellular carcinoma uh, in in Bangladesh. So, uh, if if you can talk about us. Also, uh, Professor Ashaduddin Hamed from Chittagong Medical College join us. Thank you, Ashad. Uh, he's the head of uh, gastroenterology in Chittagong Medical College. So, uh, mm. uh, thank you, Atik Bhai. Thank you, thank you, Matha. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you very much. I'm grateful to Planet uh, Health Academia uh, for giving Asia uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, I have been asked to. Uh, update you about the current perspective of ACC in Bangladesh. So uh, uh, this is uh, the past and uh, the near future uh, update about uh, the uh, incidence of ACC in Bangladesh. And as you can see that over the last 10 years, uh, uh, things have changed very little. Uh, ACC remains the same. Uh, uh, and most of these cases are actually caused by hepatitis B virus. So hepatitis B virus remains the leading cause of hepatocellular carcinoma in Bangladesh. And the unfortunate aspects is that uh, at presentation, uh, only uh, less than 10% patients uh, have a small tumor. Rest all have very big tumors, uh, mostly untreatable tumors. And if you look at the age distribution, you'll see uh, that uh, patients usually present early in Bangladesh with ACC, uh, between 31 to uh, 50 years of age, uh, which is uh, more or less uh, around uh, a decade or so uh, earlier than the global standard. So we have patients who present with advanced disease at relatively earlier age. Therefore, the economic burden of ACC uh, on the society is likely to be very high as it strikes in the uh, uh, age when one is uh, uh, expected to give maximum to his society and family. So if you look at uh, the impact of AC, uh, liver disease in Bangladesh, we can see that uh, around 10% plus admissions in our medicine wards in the public medical colleges are due to liver diseases. Uh, and uh, this is the third commonest cause of hospital admission in Bangladesh in medicine departments, uh, uh, causing around more than 22,000 deaths per year in Bangladesh. And liver cancer happens to be the third commonest cancer in Bangladesh, next to lungs and stomach cancers. Uh, this will vary, but uh, it is around the top five cancers in Bangladesh, no doubt. So you have seen the, you know, the health burden and the burden on human beings. If you look at the financial impact of a, 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 a liver cancer in Bangladesh, this was a paper that we did with East West University Department of Economics, trying to find out the cost impact of hepatitis B in Bangladesh. And you can see that uh, in the last uh, point that the cost of investigations and follow-up of hepatitis B virus created hepatocellular carcinoma is extremely high in Bangladesh. And the figures are all in millions and billions of US dollars, not in tackles. Actually, we had calculated that uh, the amount of money that is drained uh, for HBV and its complications in Bangladesh is sufficient enough to build uh, two, uh, one part the bridge every two years. Uh, having said so, it has been seen that Bangladesh is doing quite well in combating hepatitis B, which remains to be the main uh, uh, cause of ACC in Bangladesh because in 2019, uh, who officially certified that Bangladesh has attained the primary milestone of achieving sustainable development goal 3.3, uh, which means that we have to eliminate hepatitis B virus from the world by 2030. And the target was that by 2020, we should reduce the uh, prevalence of uh, hepatitis B among children of five years of age to less than 1%, which we did achieve. 
But in a very recent review in Bangladesh, uh, in vaccines, uh, we have shown that is a paper that came out really last week that this achievement of Bangladesh is in, uh, achieved by Bangladesh style because we all know that since 2014, who has been advocating bird dose vaccination? To ensure bird dose vaccination, we have to ensure uh, that if the majority, if not all deliveries are carried out in uh, hospitals under supervision, and we have trained manpower and abundance of vaccine supply in the hospitals. Uh, instead, we uh, emphasized on our uh, effect of making the EPA program successful and Bangladesh and Nepal are the two countries who achieved this goal without a bird dose vaccine program. So this is uh, what we say that vaccination in Bangladesh, our style, uh, that achieved uh, a WHO certification that we could achieve the WHO target. Having said so, having said such nice things about the uh, B-Virus vaccination program in Bangladesh, we can always expect uh, that possibly vaccination will be enough to get rid of hepatitis B-Virus and therefore ACC and all the menaces that hepatitis B-Virus causes to us. But this is a paper that we published uh, two years back with the University of Sydney and Dhaka University. Uh, we developed a model, a mathematical model, and found that even uh, if we uh, achieve a 95% vaccination uh, rate uh, sustained, even then we can we will never be able to achieve the sustainable development goal of 2030. It means that with such a uh, successful vaccination program that is certified by WHO, uh, we will not be able to eliminate hepatitis B by 2030. We will take longer time. And this was done, mind it, before the pandemic struck. After the pandemic, uh, as in uh, elsewhere in the world, the vaccination program, the, the surveillance program have been affected. So we can expect that uh, uh, this uh, uh, model will be even poorer if we had done it today. Now let me tell you about the two extremes of ACC in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, we get all the generic drugs. Uh, these are the list of hepatitis B, hepatitis C drugs, and the uh, anti-ACC drugs. And as you can see, even the monoclonal antibodies we have in Bangladesh now, except atezolizumab. Without that, uh, with the exception of that, all the drugs uh, and the monoclonal antibodies all are available in Bangladesh and are generic, local generics. We also have widely available laboratory investigations, ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, and you see a good number of hepatobiliary surgeons on the uh, screen. And because of their, uh, you know, the, uh, relentless efforts, uh, hepatic resection is also being done in Bangladesh. Uh, so we do a lot of things, but unfortunately, we have no formal ACC screening program, we ex which explains why that you know, having such good drugs, such good surgeons, such good industry facilities, such good oncologists, such good hepatologists, we are still uh, in a very uh, bad shape with ACC because we diagnose ACC at a very advanced stage, at a very late stage. So we have been doing, uh, we are a unique uh, group of hepatologists in Bangladesh because we do many things ourselves. Uh, like apart from the drugs, the these type of interventions like radiofrequency ablation is also done by hepatologists in this country. And uh, me and my team introduced uh, RFA by hepat hepatologists in, uh, on 31st March 2015. We have done hundreds of cases till now. We do transarterial chemoembolization ourselves. Uh, we have done more than 260 cases. Uh, the first case was done in 2016, and this is the team. And these are all hepatologists you see uh, working in the cath lab. Uh, and uh, we did also publish our experience uh, uh, in 2018, I believe. But uh, having said so, a very good vaccination program, uh, a very uh, good uh, availability of drugs, skilled manpower, investigations, uh, and newer therapies. The unfortunate reality remains that for Bangladesh, ACC is still a big menace because we get cases late. So um, um, no matter whatever uh, treatment options we have, we can hardly offer those to our people. So we have always been trying to develop newer therapies, uh, indulging ourselves in the research, uh, in developing newer therapies. And, and we tried very, uh, uh, in the good old days, we even tried with you know, food supplements so when we had no uh, taste and no things like that. Uh, and yeah, I'm showing you this paper that uh, we have been desperately trying to get a remedy for ACC. And uh, this uh, paper with food supplement in, in stage ACC actually was the first paper uh, showing some benefit in stage ACC by a food supplement in the world literature. But uh, we have not kept ourselves uh, limited to food supplements only. We have tried to do uh, better. So uh, just uh, the last few slides, I'll come to the, my uh, talk. Uh, uh, but in the last few slides, I'll try to highlight you what we are now planning, having done uh, taste and these things. Uh, uh, we know that ACC, uh, uh, 
develops in a, a human being uh, where the host immunity is uh, intact. So the question arises that uh, why can't the host immunity get rid of the HCC? So why the host immune, uh, immune system cannot get rid of it? Uh, so there are many causes. Uh, I won't go into any de de details. Uh, like uh, the cancer cells are regarded as self. This is very, very important concept that we are uh, considering for our uh, next line of uh, action against HCC. And the other points that you can see are the many uh, uh, points in favor of HCC to evade the host immune response. So what uh, we uh, want to do is uh, we have a, uh, we have a collaboration uh, with uh, some expected Bangladesh is based in Japan and they had done some research quite some time back where they had shown that uh, uh, if you do parkinson's ethanol injection in a tumor and then uh, treat uh, uh, the mice uh, with the uh, dendritic cells that yields in reduction of tumor size and also improves survival of uh, ACC transgenic mice. Not only that, they had also replicated similar results in humans uh, in Japan. So what they did was, uh, to repeat, uh, they did first PEI followed by dendritic cell therapy. In Bangladesh, and now uh, since we have RFA, taste, things like that, so we are not uh, going for PEI. Uh, so we are going for NASVAC. So what is NASVAC? NASVAC is a hepatitis B uh, immune uh, therapy. It's a, a drug that uh, uh, stimulates the host innate immunity and B virus specific immunity. Uh, we were involved with the development of this drug, uh, uh, which is now undergoing a big trial in uh, Japan, nine universities are collaborating. So you see the phase one paper, the phase two, three paper, both works done in Bangladesh and published subsequently. And uh, we also got uh, you know recognition by the Cuban Academy of Sciences uh, uh, for our discovery. Uh, we see the certificate there. Why I'm saying is that recently we have repurposed NASVAC for treating um, SARS-CoV-2, uh, emphasizing on the uh, effect that NASVAC stimulates innate immunity. So why I'm showing this paper, there goes a saying in Bengali that dham dham te shiva gate, meaning you praise Lord Shiva while you're grinding paddy. So I'm not doing that. Uh, I'm not uh, you know going to SARS-CoV-2 and hepatitis B and NASVAC for no reason. Uh, I'm going there because we are planning this now. What we are planning is that we uh, know now that NASVAC induces HBV specific immunity as well as innate immunity, keeping in mind that hepatitis B virus is the main, uh, you know, uh, menace uh, in Bangladesh causing uh, more than 70% of HCCs. So what we intend to do is we intend to do RFA, which will cause some tumor destruction and will induce danger signal. And then we will uh, treat the patients with NASVAC. And we hope that together that may do the trick because we have shown in COVID that NASDAQ does have innate immunity, innate immune response, apart from lab studies. Uh, so uh, that is in brief about ACC in Bangladesh. As I told you that there are two extremes. Uh, when we are thinking of immune therapy in ACC at the same time, uh, we have a, a lacking of um, uh, you know, formally, uh, formal screening program, formal follow-up program. Uh, so ACC and as I have shown you that uh, uh, vaccination uh, will not do the trick by 2030. We have to live with B virus and their faces for many more decades to come. And hence, uh, I think uh, such the webinar, such collaboration will have uh, impact and scope in the future also when we'll be talking again and again and our uh, colleagues will be talking again and again and again uh, trying to get rid of uh, ACC from Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh uh, Professor uh, Mamoun al -Matab, it's, it's a in a very short time, you uh, uh, presented a, a lot of very uh, interesting and impressive um, statistics, as well as the work you are doing, uh, especially in ASVAC. Uh, would definitely uh, like to uh, talk about it. And uh, I know um, being one of the pioneer working those drugs, uh, those uh, uh, treatment in Bangladesh would would learn, and I think uh, that's one of the goal uh, of us uh, uh, to mutually learn from each other. Hepatitis B is a big problem in Bangladesh, as well as uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, hepatitis C, on the other way, is the most common uh, hepatitis in, uh, uh, in in the United States, and uh, but we, we need to learn uh, quite a bit about it. And the way we give in birth uh, vaccination in a very organized way, that uh, pretty much eliminate uh, significantly the hepatocellular carcinoma of people who are born in this country. And uh, we really need to uh, uh, develop an effective program. And the biggest pro problem is uh, um, in birth vaccination. Um, 
and we've seen the uh, tremendous result in Bangladesh uh, in past few years. Um, now, uh, uh, Dr. Brody is back. Uh, Dr. Brody, are you here? I think very. So what happens is, unfortunately, he was uh, still not able to open the slides. But uh, his main thing will be giving uh, the overview, like you know, how the procedure actually be done. Especially, I know Y90 is is something not uh, done in Bangladesh. So he can uh, kind of tell you, you know, how the procedure is being done and everything. So unfortunately, he is not able to open his slide. Uh, and then uh, he'll be happy to take a lot of questions. I'm sure. Uh, mm -hmm. All the renowned uh, surgeons, and uh, I know Mamun does a lot of this uh, taste and all that, so he'll take all the questions. Joe, you can go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, we generally, uh, in the way we approach treating patients with local regional therapy, um, I, I use the BCLC as a guide for um, which patients to treat and, and how to treat them. Um, we, we do have our uh, multidisciplinary uh, liver conference where we uh, decide with the hepatologists and the transplant surgeons how each patient should be, how the treatment should be tailored for each one. Um, the, the ablations are, are done, we very rarely do any resections at our institution. I can't remember the last time we did one. Can you, can you ask off? No, uh, because we have all our patients are cirrhotic. So unlike like in uh, in Eastern where they're mostly so, uh, I don't yeah. think so. I think the the only we had one done at the very beginning when you first joined, but um, we haven't yeah. done for a long, long time. Very rare, yeah. So um, our our role is to typically you know we're aiming for transplantation in whoever we can, uh, whoever could be a potential candidate, and so part of our role is to. Um, to downstage or to bridge patients who are at intermediate stage or within Milan, either to downstage or bridge them to transplantation and to keep their tumor burden um, within Milan criteria until they can uh, get a liver transplant. So we use chemoembolization and yttrium 90 um, for our local regional treatments. Um, the, um, the decision as to which we use, it... Um, it, there, there's really no data to support one over the other in terms of overall survival. The, um, the, the, the yttrium 90 tends to be better for patients with larger tumor burdens, infiltrative tumor, multifocal disease, uh, vascular invasion, because it is minimally embolic. Um, we, can deliver, we can deliver the radiation. It's really a misnomer, the, the term radioembolization, because it's really, not it's really not embolization. We're just using the spheres as a vehicle to deliver the radiation. Um, there are about 32 microns in diameter. We deliver them through small microcatheters uh, in the uh, hepatic, uh, as distally as we can position them in the hepatic arterial tree uh, and uh, to deliver to the entire tumor burden. Um, we... Um, um, we use basically two different, we have the, the treatment is set up in two different stages. One is the mapping where we bring the patient in, we map out the hepatic and visceral angiography. Um, we will uh, then uh, protect any non-target branches that could be uh, potential sources of um, non-target embolization, usually gastrointestinal branches. And we do a lung shunt mapping as well to see what the hepatopulmonary shunt fraction is. Um, we use technetium macroaggregated albumin for that, which is a simulator for yttrium 90. They're roughly same, this very similar in size. And we have a, um, a, dose, a dose tolerance of the lung of 30 gray for a single dose and 50 gray cumulative. Um, and we, we want to always have an idea of how much dose that's going to go to the lung. That's rarely a problem. Um, so, you know, most patients who have a mapping done, they're able to go forward with the Y90. We do that usually the next week. Um, and, you know, like I said, I mean, we can treat, usually we would prefer Y90 for patients with vascular invasion or more multifocal or infiltrative disease. We can also treat smaller tumors doing radiation segmentectomies where we deliver um, a dose of radiation to a compartment of tissue that is uh, lethal to both the parenchyma and the tumor. Um, the Y90 is, we, we do at our institution use Y90 in combination with serafinib, which does improve overall survival compared to serafinib alone in the uh, child's QC. Uh, 
stage C patients. That's something that uh, Ashraf talked about briefly. Um, as far as chemoembolization, I mean, we use it interchangeably with Y90. And like I said, there are some instances where we would prefer to use Y90. Um, my preference is to start with yttrium 90 because um, the spheres are much smaller than the um, than the the beads we use for chemoembolization. So we 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 leave a pathway for uh, the chemoembolization to occur afterwards if we go need to use another modality. Whereas the other way around, the chemoembolization is very toxic to the vessels and it tends to prune the hepatic tree and reduce the vascular capacitance in the target artery distribution. So sometimes if we want to treat with Y90 after chemoembolization, it's not as effective because we just can't get the dose to the tumor because the vessels are so uh, corroded from the chemotherapy and the beads. So I prefer to start with Y90, but with that being said, there is a cost issue in that. So, you know, that's something that has to be considered, has to be taken into consideration. As far as using the chemoembolization as a um, combination therapy with local ablation, um, we do that quite frequently at our institution. We'll use chemoembolization um, prior to a, a microwave ablation, and that's especially helpful in larger, when we're treating larger tumors where we can devascularize the tumor, reduce the amount of heat, uh, heat something um, that occurs from the flow to the tumor. And so that increases the effectiveness of the ablation, um, which is done by our surgeons. They do them surgically with microwave. Um, the, um, like I said, I mean, the studies show with Yitrin 90 uh, intermediate stage HCC, 15 to 24 month survival, similar to chemoembolization. There's no data to suggest that one is, is superior to the other. Yitrin 90 does also have um, lower overall tech toxicity. You get less post-embolization syndrome compared to chemoembolization. So that's one of the reasons that it can you know, be better for larger tumors where patients might have significant post-embolization syndrome. Um, you know, we do give um, um, uh, medrol, I do give steroids after a Y90 to help with uh, some of the post-radiation post effects that can happen, which can be generally constitutional type symptoms patients can have a few days afterwards. Um, we give a proton pump inhibitor as well, just to help with um, any gastritis they may have from the uh, scatter radiation. Um, we do an MRI about eight weeks after the, uh, the Y90. It does take uh, longer to get tumor response from Y90 compared to chemoembolization. The peak response is usually about 12 weeks. So we image at eight weeks so we can see at that point whether the tumor is responding. And if so, we'll usually then re-image at three months. If not, then we may treat again with Y90 with a different dose, or we might use a different modality, a, a different um, local regional therapy like chemoembolization. Um, and so that's kind of a brief overview of how we manage these patients at our institution. Um, the, there is some also, the, the BCLC is not something that we, you know, uh, use necessarily verbatim exactly as it is. I mean, we, we do go outside of it and some, to some degree we'll treat pages with stage C, C um, HCC patients who are performance status one, maybe have some, um, maybe single lung nodule, some periportal, uh, you know, lymphadenopathy, as long as it's liver dominant, uh, and their, um, um, you know, their, their child's Q score is a B or better. And we will typically treat them, um, and usually in combination with serafinib in, in those stage C patients. So I don't know if there's been any questions. That's about all I really had to add. Ashraf covered most of, most of everything else in his talk. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Brody. Uh, you know, uh, Yttrium 90 is, uh, uh, you know, we see in our center in Advent Health, uh, Florida, which is a big liver transplant center, um, probably the biggest in the uh, state of Florida. Uh, the, the two very important things you, you, you brought in, one is uh, the kind of patient we see here, 
and your role to downgrading them, reducing the tumor burden to, to optimize the treatment. That is something very important. Obviously, I'm pretty sure that today's uh, um, uh, faculties will have some question about it. Uh, obviously, cost is a factor in, 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 in perspective of Bangladesh as well as uh, the technology itself. Um, you also mentioned very nicely about uh, uh, the role of chemo mobilization, how it's differ, and what are the pros and cons about it. Um, uh, thank you so much for bringing those, and we're going to have more discussion about it. At this point, you know, I'm going to talk, uh, um, get to, to listen from Professor Muhammad Ali uh, from the surgical perspective. Um, uh, he does have, uh, you know, uh, pioneered the the, the hepatitis, uh, surgery, surgery for the liver and biliary system in Bangladesh, and I'm pretty sure on a regular basis he faces that and work uh, collaboratively with the, with the uh, hepatologist. And one of the things uh, which is very important here, which uh, Dr. Brody was mentioning, that how the hepatologist, interventional radiologist, and the surgeon, transplant surgeon, work together um, to, to, to make a decision about managing a patient. So I would not wait. Uh, we're eagerly uh, waiting to hear from uh, Professor Muhammad Ali. Thank you, sir. Uh, your um, um, your uh, mic, please unmute the mic. Thank you, Dr. Atik, for uh, inviting me, and I like to thank the Plenary Generality Health Academia for uh, inviting to join this uh, highly informatic scientific um, program, and particularly uh, in this uh, that is the health issue, that is the hepatocellular carcinoma, the burning problem and uh, everywhere not only in bangladesh uh, and even in the developed country also facing the problem so the, i think the, uh, this uh, topic is the right one for uh, disseminating knowledge uh, to the uh, our uh, medical professionals as well as the uh, persons relating with the healthcare uh, in bangladesh and abroad and it's a very good opportunity for us to getting the uh, our uh, sharing our experience uh, uh, to the um, overseas our uh, colleagues and friends and well wishers uh, of Bangladesh. HCC is a really uh, what <coughs> Dr. Ashraf uh, Malik has uh, described. It really, is a uh, devastating disease and uh, it uh, causes a lot of lives uh, every year and it is uh, tremendously increasing. Uh, regarding the um, surgical management uh, in Bangladesh, uh, is the, the, if, you, if you look into the surgical aspect, there are basically two surgical aspects. One is the resection, another one is the transplantation. And uh, the, this may basically two things, but on the other hand, third one, and the most important one, is the ablation or local regional therapy. First come to the resections. In Bangladesh, the hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery, which was initiated by me in 1999 at Pardem Hospital. And uh, it is rapidly uh, advancing uh, South Speciality in Bangladesh. And uh, you will be happy to know that uh, MS course has already been run, and even FCPS hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery also being going to be started by PCPS. And uh, this hepatic resections, hepatobiliary surgery, is now is done in, in different government organizations, non government organizations, including the combined military hospital. So, a lot of liver resections are being done. Uh, I, I will say, they almost uh, uh, every month in Bangladesh, and uh, our surgeons uh, uh, are doing these things with confidence. And another thing, I will be, I am very happy to announce today that uh, <clears throat> our those who are senior uh, uh, surgeons, they are always training up the juniors. So this for the development of this hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery in Bangladesh. I congratulate them. I salute them because. This service now going to be uh, reach the uh, going to reach the uh, door of the common people, so that 
this complex surgery of suppose particularly hepatic resection biliary reconstruction sepenkare resection should go should reach to the reach of the common people so that the common people can get this benefit of this so i i know our hepatic biliary surgery colleagues are working tremendously to offer this service in the national wide we have got a lot of limitations uh, you know this hepatic biliary pancreatic surgery established in in, in a center needs uh, uh, first needs uh, manpower train manpower team of manpower and then it needs uh, equipment lot of uh, equipment other things we don't have facilities at that time and everyone if we are every center is starting to uh, uh, equip themselves to train up more persons now come to the acc status and scenario really I like to thank uh, Professor Mamun Al Mata. He has uh, rightly described the real scenario of ACC in Bangladesh. What we got uh, in the in our usual practice, we get this large ACC, advanced days, and in elderly persons. So you are understanding the first thing when a patient coming to me or to our colleagues, we are facing this. This is a very big jerk, a big tumor with extra hepatic metastasis, or having a very well pulmonary metastasis, portal vein thrombosis, hepatic vein thrombosis. This has come to us, and now what to do? And they are wanting, expecting that this service is available. They know that this. The people have got the now expectations and much expectation among us that there is. Uh, the, everybody knows that this uh, very hepatobiliary surgery in Bangladesh very much uh, uh, highly, uh, rapidly advancing, and lot of people are getting the benefit. When the patient get the benefit of liver resection, then they bring other persons, and yes, go there, and you will get the benefit. But you, we must have to think that every patient is not saying ACC. That is, uh, uh, everyone uh, cannot uh, be put in the same category. We must think about the tumor status, remaining liver status, and his general uh, status uh, before embarking on uh, doing something particularly come to the resection. So uh, most of the time, uh, we got the very limited scope of uh, resection. And when we go for the resection, we must have to be very cautious uh, uh, for uh, resections. And uh, whether the what is the functional result 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 body of that is residual uh, capacity of the uh, liver is 20 to 30 percent could be achieved or not, or the patient will go into the hepatic failure. So this is we are facing this problem, but uh, uh, we can uh, overcome this uh, uh, with uh, uh, this uh, disadvantage condition only by uh, that is this. Um, uh, deep uh, concentration to the uh, patient, evaluation of the patient, which one is the best one for the patient. Second one, uh, that is uh, for the transplantations. Yes, uh, we have started transplantation. First transplantation, we do, did this in 2010, and we are doing uh, this transplantation, but uh, not, uh, we did not make uh, transplantation yet for ACC. Uh, uh, because of uh, what, uh, as I told, that is this, those cases we got most of the time advanced and with extra body metastasis, portal vein thrombosis and other things. Yes. And, uh, and uh, needs work up and uh, needs understanding of the people also because this, uh, uh, the result of uh, liver transplantation for uh, non-ACC and ACC conditions uh, is uh, different, and uh, a patient must have to understand uh, the reality for what is this. So whatever the thing, whatever the uh, odds comes, we are trying to overcome this because the liver transplant is also an initial stage. We are advancing with uh, very cautiously with uh, uh, ex limited facilities, and we are uh, forming the team. Uh, we have uh, made the equipped centers. Uh, but ho hope, uh, hopefully, we'll start this uh, liver transplant so for this ACC patients. 
what, what I like to tell that is this, our uh, colleagues, particularly about the biliary surgery, surgeons are working uh, uh, tremendously for offering this service. One thing what I think that what I like to um, uh, be uh, with the uh, Dr. Ma Mamun al Mata, what he has told that we don't have the surveillance or HCC screening because the late diagnosis, late presentation is the main thing, resection or other things. Uh, whatever you do, that if you can get an HCC uh, in the uh, less than five centimeter, uh, 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 five centimeter, and the uh, residual liver function, uh, functional reserve volume, you can easily achieve uh, 20 to 30 percent. You can any anybody can resect the liver, no problem. But if when the, uh, the situation is being compromised, large tumor, portal venous case, extraverting metastasis, or other tumor, a multifocal, multicentral deal, then you cannot do this. Another thing is this, uh, suppose you, you will think for all right, uh, what about the next thing for transplantation? If it goes the Milan, uh, uh, beyond Milan or beyond UCSF criteria, also you cannot do anything. So early diagnosis for all those things is the best things. Regarding the local regional therapy, yes, uh, have, it, it is going on in Bangladesh and uh, it has been uh, uh, Initiated by Professor uh, Mahmoud al Matab, and uh, patients are getting ablation and also other ablation th therapies. Yes, this acts as not only uh, the uh, treatments, particularly for the VCL uh, uh, grade B patients, uh, but also it is working as a breeze for the uh, uh, transplantation, breezing for the liver resection, as well as downstaging also. I think. Uh, uh, this service also should be advanced and other things. So together, if you think that this, um, I fully agree that if uh, the uh, collaborative activities, collaborative effort, joint effort of the surgeons, uh, interventionist, uh, and uh, 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 liver transplant facilities, all these things can put, put together the final management of ACC, a total management of ACC could be possible in Bangladesh because resection is there and the ablations are there and the transplant already started uh, for other diseases. So this transplant can be uh, also can be started in Bangladesh successfully uh, for ACCs. So if we can combine work together, we can make the total management of ACC in the soil of Bangladesh. And uh, we'll be happy to see when you will see that the, the continuously the liver transplantations and uh, uh, are being done for the not only for the other diseases but also for the ACC in Bangladesh. People are getting the benefit of this service, advanced service, and uh, uh, living in their own soil with this service. Thank you again uh, for giving the opportunity and inviting me. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you talk from a surgical perspective as well as uh, emphasis. One very important thing, is, and it is hepatocellular um, carcinoma surveillance and uh, the importance of that and the load it, it put on the surgeon's uh, hand. Uh, unfortunately, uh, um, Hepatocellular carcinoma surveillance here in the United States is, uh, is, is one of the quality measures. and uh, most of the electronic medical record itself uh, remind us, uh, but uh, as a guideline, it is there in Bangladesh, but unfortunately, uh, the timely uh, surveillance uh, lead to many cases when they are not uh, supportive uh, for the surgical management. At this point, I would like to go for, in a different perspective, um, uh, an oncologist perspective, uh, perspective. Um, uh, Dr. Sajad uh, Muhammad Yusuf. Uh, Sajad Yusuf is here today and uh, he is the Chief of Radiotherapy of Chitong Medical College Hospital. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Sajad. Um, uh, Sajad, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm listening to you. Thank you. Uh, just to, to get your, your peek from your standpoint on the hepatocellular carcinoma in Bangladesh. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Atik. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good evening and good morning according to data uh, status. 
to all of you. Uh, uh, first, I want to show my uh, gratitude, love, and respect to all the health workers who have uh, sacrificed their lives and uh, giving services uh, to patients during COVID crisis. And uh, thanks to all the speakers for the nice and informative presentation of Rowdy, then Shapnil, and Professor Mohammed Ali, sir, uh, then Jaman, Ashraf Jaman. And thanks for to the uh, organizer for arranging such a program and to Atikud Jaman. So thanks Atikud Jaman for running the program so smoothly as always he does. First thing, uh, uh, first thing, according to Global Can data, 2020, liver cancer incidence is 12, but mortality was 10th highest in Bangladesh. But the, uh, the real scenario is quite different. Here we are uh, getting uh, liver cancer case more and more. It's increasing in number. And uh, one of the most common mal malignancies in the whole world, but death rate is high. Uh, a majority of patients of hepatocellular, the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma, another thing is that it's increasing. It increases with age. Uh, it is uh, higher in Asian immigrant in uh, abroad and in uh, Seabelt area. Uh, our uh, Chittagang, Greater Chittagang area, we are getting hepatocellular carcinoma more and more. Majority patients of hepatocellular carcinoma are HBCG positive and presence of uh, B E antigen uh, is a mindful increases the cause of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And again, the presence of already Jaman, as he has said, uh, presence of the various DNA and employee may increase. And hepatitis C virus, alcohol, NASH, all our causes of hepatocellular carcinoma. Another causes we are uh, now uh, we are getting aflatoxin, uh, who they are using uh, uh, betel nut. Uh, they are also suffering from hepatocellular carcinoma. For diagnosis and staging, uh, we use ultrasonogram alpha fetoprotein, uh, but uh, in case of uh, 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 if patient is solvent, then we go for uh, contrast enhanced MRI. Uh, major problem um, we face when liver parenchyma is not homogeneous, and uh, when liver uh, ASOL is smaller than uh, less than uh, one centimeter. Whatever it is, uh, surgery is the uh, many treatment options are there, but surgery is the main and curative options uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma, whether uh, through resection or transplantation. We all know, but here we uh, follow three features that define the treatment options for a patient with hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, in number one, uh, metastatic disease. Uh, number two, uh, whether the patient has metastatic disease or not. Number two, whether it is resectable or localized tumors or not. Number three, medically patient is fit. Uh, it is, uh, we call it performance status. Then, uh, we, as the transplantation, we go for, uh, in surgi surgery, is a surgical option. Uh, there are two options. Uh, one is partial hepatectomy or resection of the tumor, tumor with negative margin, uh, then uh, transplantation. Uh, surgery is the form of the treatment that offers the greatest treatment uh, for cure in hepatocellular carcinoma patient. Transplantation has become an option. Uh, we have started in Bangladesh already. It has been started transplantation successfully. But in case of, uh, uh, for unresectable disease, ma majority of patients, uh, uh, we attend uh, uh, generally, and majority, majority of patients came to us in advanced case, majority of patients. So palliative options are there. So uh, uh, here we have, uh, we do taste. Uh, we don't have, uh, we're already doing radio frequency, ablation therapy, cryotherapy, microwave therapy in Dhaka. And uh, but uh, radio isotope uh, radio embolization we don't have that. Already we have started uh, the uh, palliative EBRT, or uh, we are waiting for proton therapy. And yttrium 90s uh, we don't have in Bangladesh. We are interested to start. Already uh, government is very much interested to uh, bring all the facilities in Bangladesh. In case of chemo embolization, uh, we. Uh, Oh, it's in uh, common in uh, Dhaka. They are Shopnil and, and some uh, hepatologists. They are, they have started already successfully, and uh, uh, we are using in palliative setting uh, systemic therapy. Uh, we are using TKI, but our experience is very bad. 
surafenib and uh, lenvatinib the another uh, we were waiting for the immunotherapy already uh, it's a, i think it's a great uh, we are uh, it's a great uh, uh, opportunity for us so we are using now atezolizumab and bevacizumab now we are getting um, more good result in palliative setting in as first line therapy in hepatocellular carcinoma atezolizumab we know atezolizumab is immunotherapy and bevacizumab is an antiangiogenic therapy and uh, palliative uh, high uh, proton therapy and proton therapy and high photon therapy we are using but we are in case of photon therapy uh, uh, we are facing the radiation induced liver damage it's a major problem we are facing our uh, already browdy told us one thing that one is uh, breathing therapy breathing therapy i don't know but i think uh, it will be a major opportunity for us breathing therapy if we use that but i don't know uh, it's at the expense but uh, it's a quite expensive uh, although hepatocellular carcinoma um, is a devast can be devastating disease the best chance for prolonged survival is to screen and diagnose it it's my opinion and multidisciplinary approaches should be there to take care of hepatocellular carcinoma patients uh, we, uh, the main problem the cost uh, and major majority of majority patient majority of, patient, of patients you know come from middle class they are not able to bear the uh, 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 cost of the rocket launching effort i know the you, you know the resection is quite expensive then uh, all treatment options so at last advances in hepatocellular carcinoma prevention screening and early detection and treatment have resulted in improved survival and prognosis for a disease that a few decades ago was considered as a death sentence so in future i think uh, we'll get more and more treatment options but uh, in curative setting uh, there are no options other than surgery it's my opinion thank you vinod thank you for uh, patience listening atik are you there thank you. thank you yes i'm i'm listening thank you sajad uh, it's a wonderful presentation i have some questions i have some questions yes There uh, is a question. Can I ask now or later? No, you can answer it now, please. Uh, uh, okay. To Ashraf Jamal, uh, or uh, what about the uh, uh, if we go for ultrasonogram and alpha fetoprotein? If if it's a case of fibrinolamella type of hepatocellular carcinoma, it's more common in female. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, uh, alpha fetoprotein is not commonly raised. We don't get that. And another thing. if liver parenchyma is not homogeneous if it is less than 1 cm if patient is solvent then uh, uh, what should we do we should uh, i think it for mri a uh, uh, high contrast resolution or so, so it's, a good, it's a great question uh, uh, thank you sachin bhai um i know um uh, you know it's it's the one thing i want to before i answer this question is um the about the ACC screening before i forget because you know every speaker mentioned about uh, ACC screening um in the USA uh, definitely we're doing we, we do good in, in in screening and everything depending on the on the uh the institution and where the patient is being getting care if it's a tertiary care of course you know everybody get it. so we but we're still not the great we're still not 100% so i don't think anybody's 100% so as far as a uh, answer to your question about the uh whether I should get mri and ct uh there are uh several head to head trial about mri and head ct uh abdomen like which one is better if it is a small size smaller size i personally preferred mri and the data suggests that it's probably slightly better so if it's smaller size uh mri is is better uh imaging technique yes. than the triple face ct in case of ct you you have to uh, you have to be triple uh, face uh, it has to be triple, triple face, face. Yeah so without the without the portal venous phase you won't be able to diagnose uh you know because yeah. we need to see this vascular thing. pattern right is a, uh, so um uh, but it's, it's in, in Bangladesh we are getting more and more uh, uh female suffering from hepatocellular carcinoma after mm -hmm. histopathology then uh, we came to know that it was a case of hepatocellular type hepatocellular right. protein is normal alpha protein right so we could see Yeah it's it's not very common here in the USA uh I have several patients mostly are young they usually uh from the yeah, yeah it's a young below patient 50, below 50 yeah, yeah. below 50 oh. 
Mm-hmm. Another question is for Browdy. Can I ask? Uh, he's actually left. He has to go for emergency. But uh, let's see if I can answer it. We are very much, <laughs> we are, we are very much interested about uh, HM90. HM90. Right. I know it's a regulation. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about uh, which one you prefer? If it is a unresectable tumor, uh, portal vein thrombosis, uh, yeah, regarding portal vein thrombosis, if portal vein thrombosis is positive, then which one you prefer? Uh, a, 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 a radio embolization? Or chemo embolization as bridging so, right. So another one, means another, one, mm-hmm. another one, another one, and uh, will I uh, uh, apply both? Another one. Uh, in case of atrium uh, uh, ninety radio embolization, what type of microsphere you use in your center? It is uh, Thera or Sar, and okay. why? But which one is better? You suggest. Okay, so uh, uh, answer to your first question. Uh, if, it, if there's a portal vein thrombosis, the first question is if it is a tumor thrombus or if it's a blind thrombus. So if it is a tumor thrombus, unfortunately, you know, patients fall into the advanced stage. If it's a good performance status, uh, you know, chemotherapy is an option. But there are more and more data, and, and I think most of the center, uh, we've been using Y90 uh, in combination with the chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Uh, if it is a portal vein thrombosis, unfortunately, uh, uh, taste cannot be used because of embolic yes. effect. You know, a patient with can develop decompensation because you're you know, embolizing the hepatic artery and you already have a portal vein that is already thrombosed, so you cannot use taste on this patient. So Y90, definitely uh, the option to go uh, if it is a uh, uh, portal vein thrombosis. Uh, in regards to your second question, i probably able to answer part of the question. We use microsphere, uh, uh, you know, or, uh, the thermosphere, and I don't know answer to why we use it. Um, I don't know. Maybe I can ask Brody, and we'll, you know, I can get back to you because he's the one who does the procedure. Uh, but we, we we've been doing a more, lot more, and there are more and more data coming about wine and D. And and part of the reason is because most of our patients who have HCC are cirrhotic, so you don't want to have any embolic effect and, you know, risk of further hepatic decompensation or hepatic failure. Uh, Y90, fortunately, has um, no embolic effect. Uh, but, but the problem with the Y90 is you have, to, uh, some of the patients uh, have shunt because we know we have an entity called hepatopolymer syndrome. Yes. Some patients may have, you know, a shunt in the lungs. So if you have a big shunt, uh, you have to close it. Uh, uh, if you cannot close it, then... Uh, you cannot offer Y90 because the radiation can go to the other organs and can cause uh, damage. So, so that that's a limitation of the Y90 about the shunt. Thank you so as much. An uh, uh, as an another question, last as, okay. as an expert, uh, uh, do, do you think that uh, proton therapy will take will give us some benefit? In yes, the of like a cinema proton. The proton therapy is a very very uh, emerging therapy, um, and I have several patients. Uh, was uh, we don't do it in our institution, but I send it to uh, a like bigger center. Uh, yeah, but it's it has um, it has some promising data proton therapy, and some patients are actually getting it. We are waiting for that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Nice presentation. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Sajad. Uh, there's some very good questions, and uh, um, thank you, uh, Ashraf, to come forward and answer those. We have many good questions, and we're going to um, discuss about it at the end of the session. We have two uh, good speakers still here, and we're going to get their personal perspective. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hashim Rabbi, Associate Professor of uh, Liver Transplant and Hepatobiliary Surgery. Uh, Dr. Rabbi is a gifted surgeon and worked very closely with uh, uh, with his mentor, Professor Thank Muhammad you. Ali. Still uh, performs surgery with him, but himself, I would say that he is a young icon of... Uh, when I talk about hepatobiliary surgery in Bangladesh, I would request uh, Dr. Hashim Rabbi um, uh, to come forward and give his perspective about hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I th- am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah, thank yes, you very much you for are. giving me the opportunity uh, to be part of this uh, learned gathering. And uh, thank you very much, Atik Bhai, and Dr. Shakil and others, and the other organizers. So uh, everything I think uh, been, has been discussed and I'm very much uh, impressed and astonished by Dr. Ashraf Malik's uh, lecture and Dr. Browdy also. And I think they have mostly uh, covered everything and, and other things has been already been discussed. 
And HCC is a very big problem in our country because uh, most of the patients usually come in a later part of the presentation and only I think around five to 10 percent like other countries, it's uh, resect resectable only. And we are facing a lot of problems when uh, it's been associated with cirrhosis. We uh, we are very much comfortable with uh, dealing with the non-cirrhotic liver because we are very much uh, comfortable with resections. But uh, we face very much, uh, uh, we face a lot of problems in uh, uh, patients with cirrhotic patients. Uh, and in the worldwide data, it's, uh, HCC is more common in hepatitis C virus positive patients. But here in our country, it's very less, but... Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. We can hear you. Uh, yes. Okay. And the thing is that the NASH is also coming up in Bangladesh. So we are very much uh, in a pro situation that the NASH will some, uh, sometimes will be a, one of the main cause of liver cirrhosis in, our, in this country. So my question to Dr. Ashraf Malik is that uh, I have two questions, actually. One is uh, a very, very simple question. The, what do you do uh, after resection uh, when a patient with HCC uh, uh, after uh, DAA? Uh, we all know that the chances of uh, recurrence and as well as uh, recurrence after transplant is high in HCC. So do you do uh, any other, uh, what, what do you do to prevent uh, recurrence after resection and also after uh, liver transplant? So uh, thank you, Dr. Abdi. Uh, I'm hearing from a lot of the uh, renowned physician. I'm, I'm so glad. Uh, I didn't know because I left Bangladesh a long time ago. And uh, it's, it's, I'm really thrilled to know, you know, there's a lot of uh, surgeries and transplant and hepatobiliary surgery has been done, uh, you know, taste and all that. So, so I'm excited and, and I'm, I'm really thrilled that, you know, a lot of things being done because I left Bangladesh just right after my internship. So, uh, you know, uh, I didn't have all that knowledge. So, uh, so answer to your question, I think it's a very good point, uh, a question that there, uh, there are some data about, uh, direct acting antiviral, right? You have a question about the direct acting antiviral and resection and transplant, right, Dr. Uh, Professor Rabbi? Yes. Okay. So there is some uh, some controversy about whether or not direct acting antiviral uh, therapy, uh, yeah. patient HCC. Uh, what do you do after uh, resection uh, to prevent recurrence? So to prevent uh, recurrence, HCV, is HCV positive patient after DA. After the uh, so uh, there uh, so the background of that is that there because there was some data uh, controversy about whether or not uh, DA therapy can be associated with either you know increased risk of HCC or recurrence of HCC. Um, so it's still I think the data are not strong to say that it does cause recurrence. Um, most of the time, if the patient do get any type of uh, treatment for HCC, we want to wait for three months. Uh, there's some like you know, this is in a, like an arbitrary number, they wait for three months before you start DEA. Now, in terms of to prevent recurrence, uh, for resection, uh, the, depend, the recurrence depends on uh, several things. It depends on the X-plan, what the X-plan shows. So if the uh, if the tumor is uh, well differentiated or you know poorly differentiated, if there is any microvascular invasion, so those things matters. And also how much the margin was uh, taken out. Uh, I think all patients should get screened uh, because there's a recurrence rate of 50%. I'll show you, um, uh, I've shown you some data about 50% uh, in three years. So even after resection, the patient should uh, undergo screening, uh, maybe initially uh, with MRI, and then after that, ultrasound. Uh, because since the recurrence rate is high in the first three years, maybe getting MRI every six months, and then after that, um, you can just return to ultrasound. Uh, but every patient should undergo screening uh, so that the if there is recurrence or true recurrence within two years, a uh, patient can be treated. The transplant, uh, as long as they are within Milan criteria uh, or ECSF with a good downstage and there is no viable tumor on the uh, local regional therapy prior to transplant, uh, exceedingly rare. Um, we have not had in our transplant center any patient who had a recurrence unless uh, we had one patient who had uh, incidentally we found microvascular invasion so that person but usually the rate of recurrence after transplant is exceedingly low it's much 
much better transplant recurrence rate is much better than resection or other type of treatment. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, welcome. And uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf Malik, both. Uh, uh, at this point, I would like to hear from uh, Dr. Mohammed Saif. Saif is from Chittagong Medical College, and he is uh, uh, there right now, Associate Professor and Chief of uh, uh, Epidemiology and Transplant Surgery. Uh, Saif, I would like to uh, pick your brain now about the status of hepatobiliary surgery for hepatocellular carcinoma. I know that uh, Mamoon was mentioning that there is a high incidence in the seatbelt area, especially Chittagong. So you must have a lot of Thank you, Atik Bhai, for inviting me in such a big uh, webinar. I would also like to thank uh, um, uh, Welcome Plenary Health Academy, uh, Academia. Already, so many things already discussed by the, our learned uh, um, speakers, uh, Dr. Ashraf Malik, Dr. Mahmoud al Matab, and also a lot of discussions by the Professor Mahmoud Ali. Professor Mahmoud Ali sir already discussed so many things about the hepatobiliary status in Bangladesh, and Dr. Mahmoud al Matab um, discussed so many things about the SCC, hepatocellular carcinoma, and status of hepatocellular carcinoma in Bangladesh. I'd like to say something about the uh, hepatobiliary status in BSFA. We have a, a department in hepatobiliary surgery in Mamundu Shekhmaji Medical University. And here also the uh, hepatology department, we have a lot of uh, two courses about MD, hepatobiliary, uh, MD hepatology and hepatobiliary, MS in hepatobiliary surgery. A lot of surgeons have already uh, get MS from hepatobiliary surgery. Uh, so we do they do a lot of surgery, liver dissections, also the hypotabulary surgery. So regarding ACC, uh, I I would like to only uh, add one thing uh, along with Professor Mohamed Ali sir. We did uh, one liver transplantation uh, due to HB, hepatitis B virus related ACC, uh, our second case in Lapid Hospital. We did six liver transplantation in Bangladesh. So we started successfully liver transplantation in Bangladesh. Uh, we did three by one in BSMMU and two in Labuan Hospital, also Badem Hospital uh, by the leadership of uh, Mahmoud Ali. And they did three liver transplantation in Bangladesh. And we did three by the leadership of Professor Jilfi Roman Kansar, our chairman of the of the BSMMU. Our second case was uh, um, for HCC. So, this is the, uh, and the hepatitis B by the still related ACC. So, we successfully started, but due to uh, big threat of COVID-19, we started BSMMU very successfully in 2019. And it was started and so many patients came to me for uh, liver transplantation. But due to COVID-19 threat, it now mostly uh, at present, it is stopped due to uh, arrangements and most of our uh, liver transplant OT. Uh, it is in the block of uh, coronary uh, uh, COVID-19 patients for, for um, our uh, uh, that building, even block where our transplant uh, OT is there. So it is very promising. And regarding ACC, we did uh, mainly main treatment of liver, uh, ACC. Actually, my curative treatment is liver resections and transplantation. Both we did in our settings. And other uh, liver targeted therapy, liver targeted therapy, as uh, ablation therapy, radio frequency ablation therapy, cryoablation therapy, and uh, chemoembolizations. Dr. Shobnail, hepatology, he started uh, very successfully chemoembolization chemo embolizations tests in Bangladesh. So we are uh, in the uh, very good positions. It was good positions, but it, due to COVID situations, our we are now uh, slightly in storm, uh, holding positions. But uh, hopefully, we can after COVID. We hope we will do start start it again. So thank you very much. Um, uh, time is uh, going very. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody, for this presentation and invite me. It's such a big webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Kartik, and also. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Shakil, 
and in Dr. Rashad. I, I have only one question to Dr. Rashad Malik. Uh, what do you do if the, um, the HCC is less than one centimeter? What is your option? You wait for uh, growing it up or uh, for uh, for the uh, treatment? So, um, what we do is maybe a, a slightly different uh, from uh, from Brownish perspective. Uh, if the patient, most of our patients are cirrhotic, uh, they already have cirrhosis, uh, and as long as they don't have any other contraindication, uh, we wait for this lesion to reach two centimeters so that they can be offered the best treatment, which is a liver transplant. Uh, now, if the patient is not cirrhotic, then one centimeter lesion uh, can be either it could be resection or it could be uh, ablation. Uh, so, if it's one centimeter, less than one centimeter lesion, if it's uh, diagnosed HCC, uh, resection or, or ablation both work uh, same. So, usually that's what we do. What, uh, less than one centimeter ablation is possible? Yes, less than one centimeter ablation is possible. So less than two centimeter, if we, the tumor size is less than two centimeter, then uh, the lower, the, the shorter the tumor uh, size is, uh, the best the response is. So if you have a less than one, the, probably the ablation cavity or the efficacy will be 100%, 100% and, and there'll be much less uh, microsatellite or, you know, uh, or microvascular invasion, which you may not see on routine imaging. Uh, so if you do a biopsy, you may see a uh, very minimal microsatellite of less than one centimeter. So uh, ablation can work the same as resection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question actually for uh, uh, for a lot of the other panelists. Uh, can I ask Adibai? Yes, sure, please. Uh, okay. I, I would like you to take over this segment. Um, uh, there is some questions also in the chat. I'll, I'll bring it to you. Okay. So uh, I have... Um, so first, uh, you know, um, I know the liver transplant started in Bangladesh. I didn't know that it's still, uh, of course, because of the COVID-19, uh, it's currently on hold. So I have a question for Dr. Uh, or Professor Ali uh, about, uh, you know, the perspective and kind of give an insight how we are looking at liver transplant. Because I really, really uh, very interested to know uh, because a lot of, uh, like, you know, our neighboring country are doing a lot of transplant and I like to see same thing in Bangladesh. Uh, and, I've, you know, the only difference would be, of course, in Bangladesh will be living donor, which mostly we do disease donor. And what is the perspective? I mean, what is the future plan? And, um, you know, how, you know, Bangladesh uh, can play a major role in, you know, in that region because India is doing, uh, other countries are doing. So I think uh, uh, Dr. Ali and other surgeons, uh, I'm sure they play a major role. So what is the plan, future plan? And, I know because of the COVID-19, so currently these are on hold. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asha, for your uh, really uh, warning issue uh, of liver transplant. We, we started liver transplant successfully, and it was ongoing. And uh, we made successful last uh, transplant on 13 February 2021, 20. And, uh, uh, the patient is well, uh, there is no problem. And we were uh, uh, on the verge of, uh, because uh, Sir, you are, um, uh, please unmute, uh, sir. Very sorry. Uh, I'd like to thank them. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Ashraf for, for really is a warning uh, issue. Uh, regarding the ongoing uh, transplantation in Bangladesh. We started this liver transplant and, um, and it was ongoing. And the last transplant we made in February, uh, 13 February, 2020. And uh, the patient is well, donor is well, the recipient is also back, back to the, uh, doing everything. And the donor is, was a lawyer, he is doing his practice in the court. Uh, we have got the intention now we are full flesh ready. Initially, we don't have facilities, we don't have instruments. When I started, uh, I borrowed the instruments from different institutes and then put together and made the transplants in 2010. And after that, uh, we made a uh, project a transplant for establishment and and that is the, uh, the designated uh, uh, liver transplant center at in collaboration of the Bardem 
as well as the uh, government of Bangladesh. And we have established this. All the facilities are available, OT, stoperative care, ICU, and everything is there. In that new facility, we made this uh, last, our last uh, burdens, last third transplant uh, on 13 February. And uh, uh, we have got the intention that it, it, will, it will continue. Uh, but after that, you know, even when we were discharging patient, uh, uh, the patient, uh, the COVID-19 was uh, uh, detected in Bangladesh. Then after that, we, it is in default. And the whole, uh, we, we, our, everything is ready, equipment is ready, facilities are ready, we are ready. Uh, when the COVID situation will be uh, overcome and control, uh, uh, will, uh, by the grace of Allah, Almighty Allah permit, uh, will uh, be able to do liver transplant and it will be done, hopefully it will be done continuously and without interruption. And the patients uh, of uh, end-stage liver disease of Bangladesh will get this liver transplant in their own soil. It's very good to know, that, uh, Professor Ali. Uh, so now what I understand is now in Bardem um, Hospital, uh, the transplant, all the facility and the equipment, uh, do you plan to expand to other hospital, bigger hospital? or? Yeah, uh, uh, if uh, anybody uh, come forward, uh, because you know, uh, uh, expansion of uh, Dr. Ashraf, your understanding that uh, uh, when a question of liver transplant come, first comes the uh, manpower, second comes the equipment, third comes the dedication uh, of the whole team. So when everything could be put together, then only a liver transplant center can run. First thing, there should be an at uh, uh, expert hepatobiliary surgeon, hepatobiliary surgery center should be there. If a hepatobiliary surgeon is not there, if a um, uh, it, uh, that is surgeon or the team cannot do a uh, uh, major liver resections, how he uh, he can embark on the liver transplant? So you are understanding. If any organization start uh, uh, to st initiate liver transplant, first thing there should be trained hepatobiliary. Uh, surgic, surgeon themselves. Second thing, equipment. Then the whole team, team or multidisciplinary team should be there. So when the when surgical team and then the, the uh, equipment and the whole other uh, uh, that is the uh, uh, supporting team will be available, then only uh, a, a center, a liver transplant center can be started. We will always welcome any uh, any, any center coming forward, uh, we are ready to provide our service, cooperation, and uh, dedication, uh, whatever they want. We want multiple center uh, 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 of uh, liver transplant center should develop in Bangladesh. One thing what I always tell, even in television, I told, in our neighboring country has more than 30 centers they are doing liver transplants. Why we cannot do a liver transplant in four or five centers uh, because at least it indicates that we should continue our efforts, not concentrating in one center. I am ready because you, uh, you don't know. I am uh, when I started hepatobiliary surgery in uh, at Bardem Hospital in 1999, I joined a combined military hospital uh, 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 as honorary consultant, honorary consultant hepatobiliary surgery, I'm honorary colonel. I offered this service at uh, uh, Combined Military Hospital, honorary service in 2007, and, uh, and established a, a, another uh, hepatobiliary center at the Combined Military Hospital. I attended all their meetings. I made a made lot of uh, 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 surgeries there, uh, uh, and everything is honorary. And uh, now there is uh, already a full-fledged uh, uh, hepatobiliary center has been started at the combined military hospital. Even when they are needing, they call me, I, I'm, I'm ready to go, and I went there, I do this, this, everything uh, uh, honorary, and uh, this service I am offering since 2007. And uh, mm -hmm. another thing is this, uh, 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 the team which was working with me, they are working also at the Dhaka Medical College, and there are a lot of doctors trained up now, and they are doing a lot of liver resection, pancreatic resections, biliary reconstruction at the Dhaka Medical College. In, if, so you can, I can tell you, uh, it, with my initiative, which I started at Bardem, with my initiative, it started at Combined Military Hospital, our trained up doctors are working at the Dhaka Medical College. So you see, in three institutes, at least I can tell, 
that a, a lot of people are getting this hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery. If they want that to start a liver transplant center, we are ready to offer. And they are also working with, the, with me in this liver transplant center, uh, uh, in the liver transplant team, uh, uh, and working with me. And they are very much eager, uh, what you are telling, that they are very much eager to start liver transplant in their own centers. And I believe your uh, assumption and your presumption will one day will come true when there will be four, five, six liver transfer centers in Bangladesh. I, I think, and I, I hope so, Professor Ali. I think you did it. May I say something about the Ashok Malik questions? Yes. 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 We have uh, we, uh, another big center in DSMME. We have already uh, started uh, liver transplantation in 2019, and we have successfully done one transplant. When we started, and it is continuing, a lot of patients come to us for transplantation. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, we have a, a, enough surgeon, Dr. Lee Reading, Dr. Julfika Roman Khan, Dr. Moshin Sudhuri is here, and Dr. Bidan Chandra Dash, he also attend from abroad. And I am also attend from, uh, uh, along with uh, Dr. Sain from India. And we have a lot of um, uh, fellow and already so many uh, qualified uh, hepatobiliary surgeons, already 12 already passed in MS hepatobiliary surgery. They already trained and they know everything. They do liver transplant, they assist the liver transplantation, they do liver decision and pancreatic decision, biliary decision, a lot of things. And we have a very two, two good quality OT uh, in uh, Bangabandhu Shepmujik Medical University. It is well equipped and everything is there. So. Uh, hopefully, when you started, and uh, patients also come come to us, and that situation at that time, COVID started, and due to COVID situation, whole world while uh, stopped. Um, some some uh, other center they started, but we are trying to start again for uh, uh, transplantation, but it is now well established. So you can uh, easily you can think of, uh, depend on us um, when it will start, and hopefully we'll start it again. Um, uh, very successfully. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Very, very good to know. It gives a lot of hope. It's very good to know that. No, I, I, Ashok, I, I, wanted to know that I think what about the infrastructure? I mean, we should right, develop exactly. the you. infrastructure. We have a very good surgeon. I we are very much grateful. We Bangladeshi people, the Muhammad Ali sir, his contribution. Uh, in case of in a hepatobiliary era surgery, sur <coughs> surgical case, he has done lots. We are very, very much grateful. He is one of the best in this subcontinent, not in Bangladesh. And so many uh, consultants are coming. So uh, uh, we are hoping that in future you will help us also. So, but uh, we need an infrastructure. Team. Can I? Central uh, Central Central. Yes. Shakir. Can I make a point respectfully? I mean, like. Um, I mean, we don't need to talk about Professor Mahmoud Ali. We all know uh, what a great guy he is. I mean, when Mahmoud Ali sir came in Bangladesh, to Bangladesh, yeah. there was no existence of hepatobiliary service. It's, it's a fantastic job what uh, yeah. sir has done. However, for liver transplantation, I think we should be very, very careful. I can tell you this from my experience in cardiothoracic transplantation. So what we have seen is, that if you have too many centers doing small number of cases because of lack of infrastructure, because of lack of expertise, the results are not great. So, you know, yes. in Europe, you will see some centers where they do two heart transplant, another center does five heart transplant, another center does six heart transplant. Their results are not great. Like I, I was yes. trained in Cambridge where we used to do 100 transplant and the results were outstanding. That's why I think Whilst we all agree that hepatobiliary should be practiced in every hospital around the country, however, hepatobiliary transplantation should be concentrated in only one to two centers. Once Center these centers reach full saturity, and we know that these two centers cannot cope, then other centers should be allowed. This should be heavily, uh, heavily guarded. Otherwise, you know, we will have centers opening up just for the sake of liver transplant, they are going to do one liver transplant with extremely bad results. I mean, I, I think without offending anyone, I have uh, <laughs> tried to uh, get my message across. Thank you. You're, you're absolutely right. And when it comes to a liver transplant or any transplant, you know, uh, there's a very strict criteria to open a center. So they look at the national necessity, the total number of cases, the next part is all those. Just to give an example, in the state of Florida, which is much bigger than Bangladesh, 
though the population is not as high as Bangladesh, but we have only three liver transplant centers. One is our own uh, Advent Health, another is uh, uh, the uh, Tampa General, another is Miami, uh, uh, which is the uh, University of Miami Transplant Center. And uh, you are absolutely right, Shaquille, that, uh, um, uh, and uh, I think a lot of us will agree that uh, uh, in, in, when the volume is very high, um, the, the, that's where the most successful transplant surgery happen. And uh, not only that, surgery, the post-transplant complications is managed carefully as well as uh, the survival is better. It's, it's, a, it's a very known fact, and I totally agree with what you say. Um, so, and transplant um, physicians, very important. Physicians and the infrastructure. I, I think, absolutely. you know, if you ask me whether uh, someone can do heart transplant in Bangladesh, I can tell you now that Bangladesh has fantastic cardiac surgeons. They can do that technical aspect of surgery as good as any surgeon in the world. However, if you ask me, is the infrastructure there? Not yet. So it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, building an infrastructure, tissue matching, perioperative management, dealing with the complications. That's where the problem is. I, I mean, uh, with Mahud Ali, sir, I've worked very closely, Rabbi by Mahud Ali, sir. And I know that they have a team of 15, 20 people. SAR has trained around 15, 20 people, if you uh, consider even the juniors. That's why they have been successful. And same thing goes for BSMMU as well. They have some really good surgeons, good team. That's why they have been successful. But if we think that we are going to start it in every center, the results will be very, very bad, I think. Until... Uh, I, I, have a, I have a different perspective. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Sajjad Yusuf. Uh, one of the uh, participants asked a question about what is the cost of atezolizumab and uh, levocizumab in Bangladesh? Sajjad, unmute, please. Sajjad. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, basically, I'm a uh, consultant. Okay. Uh, it's a quite expensive, but I don't know about the price, but there is some business uh, promotion which has been given by the company, uh, Roche, I think. They have that, they are marketing in, in Bangladesh and Beacon Oncology uh, already there in the field of immunotherapy, they are producing. I think it, it, uh, uh, the Bibasuji map, it will cost uh, per uh, cycle, it will, uh, it will cost about Bibasuji map and uh, Atizulazum, it will cost, uh, I think, two lakhs, about two lakhs per uh, cycles. In Bangladeshi taka BDT, but uh, uh, already they have given some uh, the, the business promotion. I think they are interested to uh, reduce the price or one to buy to uh, get one fee like that. I think I would like to uh, uh, kind of echo what you say, and uh, Shakil. I think you know. Uh, th that that was uh, that was another my uh, point about the infrastructure. In I think that's very important. Uh, now, as far as the number goes, you know, you don't start number hundred just to begin with. You know, we, you know, slowly you start to begin, but it will start with the one to two centers, or you know. Uh, but the infrastructure is very important. Uh, liver is different. Uh, you know, as you know, when I start beginning my talk, it's in a lot of ways because we don't need tissue typing for liver. You just need blood type. So, you know, that's a, that's a, that's the beauty of liver transplant. You don't need to do any tissue typing. As long as your blood, blood I'm sure, uh, you know, Professor Ali Sar uh, knows, you know, very well, you know, and he has done a lot of uh, uh, contribution to the uh, HPLV surgeon body. So, so infrastructure is, is, is uh, you know, and I'm sure he have, you know, he has looked into it and, and that's why he started at Bardem and, you know, um, in probably getting trained. So when, and I'm just going back when the first liver transplant uh, occurred in over in in the world. That was uh, by Dr. Uh, Thomas Charles. And uh, what happened was that was in the USA, and all over the country, like the world, uh, the surgeons came and get trained. Uh, so something like that, uh, you know, Sir uh, Professor Alisa can do, like you know, have uh, people train so that at least they start the training. And then as the number will grow, uh, then, you know, because uh, if you, you, you will get, you'll get expert by doing more cases. So, so you'll do a cases with, uh, with somebody who is really expert and that's how you learn. So center uh, of excellence. It's, hmm? it's like that center of excellence. Right, right. Uh, we are almost here for more than two hours. I mean, I, I just cannot <laughs> believe 
and uh, I cannot believe it either. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and it's, the more we go, the, 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 it is getting more interesting. Uh, but, uh, you know, I know in Bangladesh, there is, uh, it's, it's night. Uh, it's quite now, late at night now. It's uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, but, you know, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, if, 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 if anybody have any question, please come forward and ask before we really finish this uh, wonderful session. One thing I, 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 I was very grateful to all of you, Hepatosoma carcinoma, to begin with, is a very, very super specialized topics, and uh, uh, I am so thrilled to see that we have so many uh, experts join from everywhere, and uh, um, it's, it's it's really amazing um, uh, to see. And um, I think in future, collaboratively, uh, we should do uh, some programs. One of the things I think um, what me and Ash Ashraf was saying that in future we can do uh, some more sessions. Uh, um, uh, bringing some transplant uh, hepatologists uh, and uh, help uh, to coordinate some um, some um, some uh, webinar together. Uh, I think, um, I think there is can... field. It's, uh, there's a lot of scope to work together. Yes. It's the same way uh, I was talking to Dr. Mamun Al Matab that uh, with his fellows, if we can do the case presentation uh, series or we can do. Uh, uh, general club together. So th those are the scopes that we have in future to do together. Um, so before I so think, can, can I interrupt a little bit? Uh, so uh, um, follow up on your uh, comments about uh, future session, uh, like uh, we're discussing. Uh, I was I did talk to our chief of transfer surgery, and uh, you know he's kind enough to say that you know he'll be happy to give a talk on the resection and microventilation and all that. And then of course, I'll ask one of our oncology colleagues to uh, kind of talk about a little bit more of the oncology perspective. Uh, I have a future plan and I don't know, uh, hopefully when the COVID will end completely. Uh, I did talk to our surgeon also, you know, he's a very good friend of mine and uh, to kind of do a workshop in Bangladesh, you know, like doing uh, to bring to Bangladesh, of course, the cost and everything, something, you know, that's something we have to look at in the future, but uh, if he agrees, maybe I do a uh, one week of uh, week of like you know workshop uh, about uh, uh, cases in Bangladesh, like you know uh, resection and microablation, you know, uh, just to get uh, share his experience uh, with uh, you know all the uh, surgeons in Bangladesh and their experience with him. So uh, that's something I have a plan in the future. So and I'll leave it up to uh, uh, Professor Ali Ma Mamoon and uh, Dr. Rabbi and everybody else. So, but that's something you know. Uh, when the COVID will end up, that's something you know I have a plan. And I did talk to uh, I think by a lot of times we do discuss a lot of times about this. So I did talk to him about it also. Yeah, Sounds we have uh, just to let you know we have 20, uh, 21 sub specialties. We have a meeting going on some weekend. We have like uh, cool. eight session goes on, and uh, we have speakers from all over the world. We talked about it, and we we we, we thought that maybe uh, not this year. We twenty twenty two. Uh, February, we are we are hoping that we will have a big uh, session where all of us and all the invited uh, faculties can go to Bangladesh and do a big, big, uh, you know, like a digestive disease week kind of session where it's it's run for seven days with various um, uh, expertise with various institutions. If you can do, and the great thing is that the 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 the, the response we're getting from uh, the expert in Bangladesh, like Shopnil, like Professor Ali, Dr. Rabbi, Dr. Saif. Uh, Dr. Sajjad, you know, um, it's it's really amazing, and that's why uh, Dr. Tazbir Bhai, who is the who is the, the chairman of the directors, and Dr. Shakil, I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Nasser Khan and Dr. Hafiz, uh, uh, we are we are really dream a lot of things uh, to do together, uh, and uh, I'm I'm really looking forward for that. I I hope we can do that in future. Professor Ali, you, you yeah, want to say something? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your really, uh, for this uh, presentation and this uh, arrangement and your vision of uh, continuing this. Really, I think it will be a wonderful thing to yes, continue sir. this and uh, exchange of views, transfer of ideas, and uh, uh, and development of this South specialities and uh, other aspects in Bangladesh. Uh, I really, uh, Congratulate your uh, everyone's attitude towards uh, Bangladesh, your own country, uh, all nationals, so that uh, the peoples can benefit uh, uh, from your uh, expertise. 
and uh, uh, share the knowledge and technology transfer, transfer is possible in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Mamun Al Matab is here. Uh, Mamun uh, Matab Shapnil, are you here? Yes, I think I am here. Yeah, just uh, you know, your uh, final comments. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I have been uh, here throughout, although I was not always visible. I did enjoy the, uh, you know, the talks a lot and the discussion. Uh, and uh, this is a very good initiative that you have taken, uh, staying outside Bangladesh. Uh, the NRBs, I do believe, can contribute a lot to take Bangladesh from there to the Bangladesh that we dream in 2021. And uh, if you uh, want to collaborate with us, uh, we are always willing, we are always accommodating and welcoming. Whatever way you want to um, come, we will be there because it is uh, for our benefit that we know very well. So hopefully in the future, we'll be working together. The entire hyper department will be working together with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rabbi, uh, Hashim Rabbi. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what I want to mention that we should, we first have to do some projects together. Uh, we all are Bangladeshis. We are all born here in Bangladesh, but we have to learn your Western attitude to implement those things in our country first. This is the first thing I think we should develop that we have to change our attitude learning uh, learning by doing and everything whatever uh, I, we want i just want to suggest that we should do some projects together so that we can also learn some research work how you do in us we can develop those things in our perspective i think uh, you can take this kind of initiative and we also can take these kind of initiatives developing this thing develop ourselves also thank you i think the feeling is mutual uh, we, we will we'll learn from each other and we can work on a working group together i think uh, I, I'm, I'm really getting excited um, uh, as uh, ashraf malik is a, a leading hepatologist transplant hepatologist here um, we do have um, a, a big team and we can work together and, um, and sort out what are the approaches we can take in future. Saif, you are there in BSS. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Atik Bhai. Uh, what is said by uh, Dr. Mashab Malik about the exchange program? We always really encourage the exchange program. Uh, and uh, workshop in uh, also in Bangladesh as we everybody in Bangladesh. So, uh, the collaboration program always encouraged and uh, if you, uh, in future uh, I think uh, you will arrange this collaboration program. Thank you very much for future uh, webinar. No, thank you, Saif. You know, being um, BSMME is one of the leading, uh, it's a, it is the leading postgraduate institution in Bangladesh. You are there. Uh, so yes, hopefully, yes. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do some programs for your fellows uh, in, in future together. Um, as well as the fellows in um, Ibrahim uh, uh, Hospital as well. Um, I see um, um, uh, Sajjad already talked, and um, um, if I'm missing anybody here today, um, uh, if, if any, any question, please come forward to ask a question. Um, and I see Dr. Ishaduddin, um, Dr. Ishad from, uh, Professor Ishad from Chittagong Medical College is here. I don't know, Ishad is still available here on the screen. Ishad is there. So yes. Thank you for thank you for hearing us. Uh, one of our bright students, when I was a student, Ishad was younger, and uh, uh, he, uh, you know, in past with the PHA, Ishad uh, was uh, one of the um, uh, speaker and moderator in our courses. Thank you, Ishad, being here. Thank you, Ishad. Thank you. Thank Ashad. you, Atik Bhai. Uh, thank you, Ashad. We enjoyed a lot your lecture. Nice lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Saif is also our friend, Dr. Saif. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, uh, yes, I think, so very uh, nice to see you in this webinar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I hope in future you will again join with uh, along with the uh, other colleagues from Chittagong. Hmm. Sure, sure. Thank you. So I am also always available. Thank you so much.
We're planning uh, next time when the corona is better, when you'll go in person in Bangladesh, we're looking forward to doing a program in Dhaka and Chittagong and other places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Atik Bhai always is there in Chittagong, in Dhaka, always there. And always uh, there, there is uh, some kind of collaborative efforts, mainly from initiative, from mainly from Atik Bhai. No, thank we you. are eagerly waiting for future collaborative efforts. We will do that, inshallah. So, you know, I would like to thank everyone. I think we are uh, we're really late, almost one and a half hour. So yeah. um, I would like to thank everyone uh, in future. Um, um, inshallah, we're looking forward to do more collaborative work and uh, on the hepatobiliary front uh, from Bangladesh um, and uh, uh, from here. And uh, another person is Shaquille. Uh, and Shaquille is very excited when you're talking about it. In future, he's, he wanted to bring somebody uh, from the leading institute in Eng England um, in our group um, to do some more collaboration. And uh, I'm very proud uh, to work with Shaquille, um, you know, uh, my younger brother. So uh, um, I would like to not take much time. Um, it's a month of Ramadan. You know, may Allah give us mercy and uh, accept our rojas and, uh, you know, uh, let us work together. We have some important conferences are coming ahead of us, um, uh, financial and socioeconomic perspective of COVID. There's a lecture coming on 29th. Um, we are planning to uh, do some sessions uh, uh, right after the Ramzan um, um, about um, uh, some more uh, gastroenterology and hepatology perspective to come. Please feel free to let us know if you have any interest on any topics, we can do a combined session. Uh, we can bring it together. Please feel free to let us know. We are. Uh, we think that we have responsibility to give back to our country. Once again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Atik. Thank, 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 thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shakil. Many thanks. Thank you. Lovely to see you all. Hello, Tekken. Come on. Thank you, Ashraf. Atik. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Shakil. Thank you.